My story is nothing special, but I feel like I should write it down and tell it. It was during the summer of 2017 when my family had gone on vacation to California. We were at the end of our trip in which we'd been driving from San Francisco to Los Angeles to catch our plane back home. We had just finished seeing John Steinbeck's family home in Salinas earlier, and we were heading back to Los Angeles. I remember us passing the golden valleys where several wineries dotted the landscape. The sun was beginning to descend, as it was some time in the mid-afternoon, possibly around four or five. We were all packed into a rental van, with most of my family members being asleep save for my dad who was driving, my grandmother, who sat in the front with him, and myself, who was sitting in the right side of the back. As we were coming around a bend in the road, our backs to the wineries, I suddenly heard my dad say, what is that? Being in the back, I could only peek at his side of the van, but I definitely could make out a dark figure crossing from the left side of the road. Reasoning that I would see it in just a few seconds, I quickly darted to my side, where surely I would see whatever or whoever it was come into view. As we got closer, I saw the figure suddenly change posture from upright to walking on all fours before disappearing behind the hill we were coming around. I attempted to see if I could see it behind the hill, but to my surprise, there was nothing there. There was nowhere for it to hide, considering it was man-sized, so I was dumbfounded. My dad and I were both confused. As he was paying attention to the road, he had only seen it upright. My grandmother was more than likely zoned out, as despite being in the front, she failed to see anything. Both my dad and I believe in the paranormal, and while he believed it was a Sasquatch, I believe it could have been a skinwalker, or something similar. So far, it's the only instance of the paranormal I've come across in my life, but I still think about what that might have been to this day. I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal, my alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that, and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock, and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55, and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 5.56. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 5.56. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning, and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about 7, and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, 
but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had street lights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no street lights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far-off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east. There were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone, because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did, and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about 10 feet behind her, when we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard, where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet, which was only about five to ten yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, well, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus, so I knocked on his door for a good three minutes, to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, it's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, 
and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life, and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing, and then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts, since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school, and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane, and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane, in a heavily forested area, that the plane was about to crash, but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, and some she tells us about, and others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins, which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces and she said she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me, sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the sun was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down. And that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. 
After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said, or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that, though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common, and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. In the summer of 2012, I took a job as an expedition canoe guide on the Boundary Waters. It was in northern Minnesota, southern Ontario. This is a massive wilderness area of lakes and land. I was working for the Boy Scouts, and we were based on Moose Lake, on the U.S. side. My job was to facilitate a fun and safe multi-day trip, anywhere from 7 to 12 days out. Most of that summer was typical, but one expedition in particular still haunts me as a result of what happened to us over the course of a few days. Here's the account in full. My crew was on the younger side. There were nine of us in total, the maximum allowed in a group per our permit. There were six scouts, two adult advisors or scoutmasters, and myself. They had wanted to do a 200 miler, but didn't have the physical ability so we had to amend our route. They were bummed out, so I decided to take them to a waterfall called Eddy Falls. It's pretty flat up there, so a waterfall is somewhat rare, but that decision would end up putting us in the path of something. We visited the falls and camped near to it. That evening, I had the boys working on camp setup while the advisors worked on fire for dinner. I was collecting firewood in a big tangle of downed trees, brush, and bramble. I could faintly hear the falls off to my left, when out of nowhere, I hear the most unearthly scream or roar I've ever heard. It stopped me dead in my tracks, and I was frozen. The second scream was closer, and the third was closer still. I couldn't see anything due to the thickness of the brush, but whatever this was, it was coming directly at me. By the fourth scream, I could feel it in my chest. I got really nauseated, and involuntarily, I barked at it. I've never before or since heard that sound come out of my body. The fifth scream almost physically hurt, but it snapped me back to reality and I ran back to camp. My crew had heard it too, but what was I supposed to tell them? I claimed that it was a boar. There are no boar up there, and the advisors knew that I was lying, but they didn't call my bluff. After dinner, they went to their tents, and I retired to my hammock, about 50 yards from camp. As a rule, I always set my hammock at head height, so about six feet up. I would use a tarp over my body and head to keep the morning dew off and the morning mosquitoes at bay, but the tarp wasn't strung up that's important. It was just loosely over me. It must have been around three to four in the morning when I was awakened by what sounded to me like a woman sobbing. Not an outright cry, but a sob. At the same time, I'm hearing something walking through the thick brush down past my feet. So I listen, totally still and quiet, as it crosses into camp. I could hear the change from brush to granite rock, but could still hear its heavy footfalls as it walked right through camp, and on toward me. At this point the tarp is still over my head, so I can't see a thing, and I don't know what to do. In no time, it was standing right next to me. I could hear the breathing, loud and congested sounding. I could smell the musk. I could feel its enormous presence only inches from my body, just standing there. Time to make a decision. I suddenly threw the tarp off my head, 
And as I did this, my left hand touched the thing in the chest. It was dark, but I could make out briefly a very large upright figure. The hair on it was long and coarse. The musculature was impressive. Bodybuilder status pectoral is what I touched. It all happened in a second, and as soon as my hand made contact, it bolted back into the brush with immense speed for such thick debris. By the time I got my headlamp on, it was gone. My crew had slept through it all, so I read until the sun came up and decided not to mention it. The next day we moved on a few miles toward base camp and camped on a small island. Campsites on the U.S. side are designated by a fire pit and a grumper, which is a fiberglass toilet over a deep hole. We were just arriving, and it was evening. One of the adult advisors needed to visit the grumper, so he walked toward it. About two minutes later, we heard him yelling, and he came running back to camp, still pulling his pants up. He said that he had just seen a gorilla run right in front of him. I asked if maybe it was a bear, and he said absolutely not, that he'd hunted bear for years and it was no bear. It was a monkey, and it was about nine feet tall. At this height estimate, I'm imagined being back in my hammock. If I touched the chest, and I was about six feet off the ground, that puts the head close to nine feet up. Was it stalking us? Was there more than one? The boys are now scared. Time to mitigate. I suggest a night paddle. No one's sleeping anymore anyway, so we pack back up and set out at around 8 p.m. and paddled by headlamp for several miles. My plan was to get back onto Moose Lake and camp very near to base so we could be the first crew off water the following day. Moose Lake is connected to Newfound Lake by a small pinch and a channel of water that's not very deep or wide. There are dark woods on both sides. We were right in the middle of the pinch when a rock the size of a basketball came flying out of the woods on the right side and narrowly missed the bow of the canoe that I was steering. There's no cliff there. This thing was forcefully thrown at us from the tree line. At this, we paddled like hell. We paddled to the center of Moose Lake, tied all three canoes together, and sat out there all night. With the sunrise, we paddled to base camp and ended our expedition. They didn't want to talk about what happened, and I was okay with that. They left for Oklahoma the next day. After they left, I went to work a shift in the canoe yard helping crews offload. My buddy Justin got back that day from a trip in the same area that we'd been in bare loop. And as I was helping him put a boat on the rack, I noticed he had a distant look, almost a thousand yard stare. I asked how his trip went, and he said it was all good until they hit Knife Lake or Newfound Lake. He said that they were being messed with for two nights on Knife, and then had a rock thrown at them in the Newfound Pinch. Sure enough, for a solid two weeks after that, Crews kept coming back from that area with very similar stories. One night, there was a crowd of us guides in the staff lodge swapping trail stories, and these encounters came up, one after another. Screams, rocks, sightings of apes. Then from the back corner of the room, I hear a chuckle. It's one of the old veteran guides who'd been there for over a decade. All he said was, it's about time somebody else seen one. I asked how long he'd known they were there. He said he's been encountering them for 10 years. Then he said, they talk to me. This shocked me. Like a language? I asked. Nah, they communicate telepathically. The less you acknowledge them, the less they'll bother you, but they can read you. And they like it when you're afraid a game to them. What happened out there is still a big question in my mind. I've always been open to the idea of Sasquatch. Their existence was never a huge stretch for me. But what really sticks with me is the way that veteran guide spoke of their intelligence 
and parapsychological abilities, that they can read human emotion as clear as pages in a book, that they know our species better than we know ourselves. When I was about six years old, I woke up during the night and made eye contact with a strange humanoid creature. It was looking at me through my bedroom window. My room was ground level and my bed was facing the window. Strangely, I remember choosing to leave my curtains open that night for the first time ever. So whatever this thing was, was in full view. When I initially saw it, I was completely dumbfounded and couldn't believe my eyes. I shook my head no, as I was thinking that this couldn't really be happening. I pinched myself to make sure that I wasn't dreaming. Then the creature frowned. I nodded my head yes, and the creature smiled. Again I shook my head no, and it frowned. So I nodded, and once again it smiled. I may have repeated this a few more times. Whatever it was seemed to be almost greenish in color and had a roundish face. Kind of like Yoda. I can't remember all of the details, but I distinctly remember telling myself that this was really happening and not to allow myself to chalk it up later to being a dream. I kept telling myself over and over, this was real. This was not a dream. This was real. I still have no idea what that thing was. So I moved into my grandparents' house around five months ago but I spent a lot of my childhood there as well. I smoke, so I find myself alone out on my back deck a lot at the evening and nighttime. The deck faces the garden portion of my backyard. To my left is the alley between our neighbor's fence, and to my right is a cemented area, including my garage and the rest of my house. And at night, even with a bright porch light, my backyard is dark dark to the point that you can't see a foot past the deck. We have three sets of small motion lights that are continuously set off throughout the night, as well as a camera facing the backyard that will send motion notifications. And when watching the footage, there's only ever bushes and trees moving. Those really shouldn't set off the detector. I've heard noises every single time I go out there at night. At first, as any person would do, I passed them off as animals. The noises included thumps and scratching on the rain guard above the deck, footstep-like sounds on the concrete, and gravel being scattered, which is visible from my deck, and I've seen gravel tossed around with no possible cause around the area, branches crack above and in front of me, and trees and bushes are rustled. I've seen a humanoid figure twice in the farthest part of my garden. Both times I instantly went inside the house. I constantly feel like I'm being watched. Depending on what I'm hearing, I've felt worse, and I absolutely hate going outside at night here by myself. Just tonight I heard something that I haven't heard before, and the only thing I can compare it to is the screeching noise that squirrels can make, but mixed with an inhuman yell. I freaked the hell out and went right inside. I know a lot about cryptids, specifically wendigos and skinwalkers, and I really can't imagine that being what this is. But I'm a very logical person, and I can't find any proof of it being any type of animal. So who knows? I just talked to my buddy tonight on the phone for a few minutes. 
While we were talking, I asked him where he was. He said he was in the desert of Arizona at that exact moment. Just for the heck of it, I asked him if he had seen any weird UFOs out on those open highways driving at night. And this was his reply. No, I haven't seen anything like that. But about three months ago, I was out here driving and it was late at night. I was in the desert. I noticed something on the side of the road. At first, I thought it was somebody wearing a raincoat. It was about five feet tall, shaped like a human, and was black. As I got closer to it, it spread out wings, and then went straight up into the air. It didn't flap its wings, or anything like that. It just went straight up and out of sight, very quickly. I was like, wow, no kidding. He said he thought about it, and then told me maybe it was a condor. But I was like, no man, those kinds of birds have to get a running start, and it takes them a few feet to even get off the ground. It's too bad he didn't get a better look at what he was actually seeing before it took off. As we were talking, his signal started to go in and out, so I let him go. I'm going to try to talk to him this weekend when he's back home, and see what else he's experienced. But, yeah, apparently he saw a humanoid. He's a trucker, so he gets to go all over, and I'm sure he's seen some other things as well. I can't wait to find out the rest of his story. A little background. My two closest friends and I were always trying to get creative with the games that we would play. One night when we were in the ninth grade, we were having a sleepover at T's house. T had a lot of toy weapons still in the garage that he never threw out. So in this game of hide and seek, the seeker used the lightsabers and nerf guns to tag the hiding players. We played outside at night in December which made it spooky and hard to find each other. So once a player was found, they too would become a seeker. After a few rounds, it was my turn to be seeker. I first found Jay, so we quietly started searching for T. In T's neighborhood, all of the houses are really tight and dark. So we would usually hide in between people's houses. As Jay and I were walking down the street, I thought I heard shuffling in the rocks behind an AC unit. Of course, we thought it was T, so we started telling him, all right, come on out, you've been found. But nobody answered. Seconds after, a white hairless head with dark eyes popped up and looked at us and then ducked back down. It was obviously not T, and like the kids we were, we ran off yelling T's name to come back to the house. He ended up being on the other side of the neighborhood, and when we went back to investigate, we found nothing. Jay and I still remember, and T makes fun of us because he thought we were joking, but we know we saw the exact same thing. I have no clue what it could have been, but it definitely looked like a person, and not a person at the same time. I'm an adult now, but it still gives me chills. Somewhere around 2013 or 2014, I was leading my sister, who was then about 15 or 16, to a forest that I would sometimes go to with a friend. The way it was set up is there was this giant ditch or valley that had a bunch of water in the bottom. So if you fell, you could easily get injured or drown from the size of it. The ditch went in a straight line in front of the forest and there was this little concrete dam type thing that you could walk on to get across to the forest. It's nighttime and I've never been there at night. My sister wanted a place to smoke cigarettes, so we walked there with one of her other friends who was like 17 or 18. As we got up to the dam, we all see this five to seven foot tall person type thing. And as soon as it sees us, it starts jumping towards us, about four feet in the air. Its movement was a little clumsy, if I can remember right. 
When it started jumping, we all ran as quickly as we could and went back home. It was shaped like a human, but its legs looked like a goat. It almost looked like it was wearing a light gray jacket, but maybe it was fur. There was very little light, so it was hard to see well. We never told anybody about it because we were all underage. Told our parents that we were going to church, didn't tell them we were gonna wander around. So we didn't wanna get in trouble. I don't think there was some Olympic jumper out there doing weird stuff in the forest either. The forest has signs all around it saying to stay out, so I don't think people would really do that. One time after my sister turned 18, I texted her about it. She said that she remembers the thing being all black, so either one of us might be right. I'm not really sure what we saw. I know that there have been Goatman sightings out in that area for decades, so maybe that was it. If you have any ideas, let me know. I'm an outdoorsman. I'm very experienced in hunting, camping, hiking, and general survival. I'm very familiar with and used to wildlife, and I was charged by what I believe was a cryptid called a dogman. It charged both my cousin and I. It was not a bear. A bear cannot move how this thing did. And it wasn't a normal wolf, as they can't comfortably run on two legs whereas what charged us seemed natural at doing that. This happened around June or July of 2007. I was around 17 years old and a lot more cocky then, but I still was somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. My family used to own a cabin in Northwest Wisconsin. I basically grew up there in the summer. I knew the woods well, but at night it was wise to stay in the cabin or at least by the bonfire at the beach because of bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if you were having a bonfire, the tree line was visible from the fire pit and the beach. And at night, you always felt like you were being watched from that tree line. But during the day, the woods always seemed normal, not so creepy at all. That is until this incident. So this happened somewhere between noon and four o'clock. My cousin and I were having an airsoft battle. I was in full woodland camo. He was not. I retreated onto the ATV trail into the woods for a tactical advantage, and our battle took us about 200 meters in to about a third of the way up the trail. We had enough at this point and were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail, just talking, and he was maybe 10 feet from me when I decided to mess with him. I shushed him and said, were being watched. He froze. But then I realized that the woods were dead quiet, and I got spooked. At that point, it wasn't so much of a joke. I started to scan the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right when I saw it. Its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. I don't expect you to believe me, but what I saw was a wolf-type creature as big as a black bear, at least 300 pounds, but it wasn't normal. This wolf was on two legs, crouching next to a tree with its arm grasping the tree, grasping with a clawed hand. It had reddish-brown fur. I told my cousin, we have to go, and the next thing I know, he's sprinting. I looked back at Wolfie, who had locked on and sprinted a few steps on two feet. Then I turned and ran as fast as I could. Right before I turned, it looked like Wolfie was dropping onto all fours. It charged us, and it sounded like it was right on our asses as we barreled through the brush. But for whatever reason, it let us go when we broke out of the tree line and headed for the cabin. What stuck with me the most was the sheer size of this thing. Wolfie appeared to be about seven feet tall when upright and that where it should have had front paws, it appeared to have large, clawed hands. Now I'm not sure how to explain this away rationally. I've heard wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, 
But as far as I know, they only go a couple of steps, and they certainly can't sprint on two legs. Nor do wolves get that big, and black bears sort of waddle on two legs, so it couldn't have been either of those creatures. The closest description, as silly as it sounds, is a werewolf or a dogman. This story happened to my cousin, who was visiting our grandmother on the Navajo Nation Reservation. He was what you would call an urban Navajo, born and raised in Phoenix and rarely visited the res. He was raised in the church and was aware of certain Navajo taboos and folklore, but didn't heed or abide by any. He and his older brother used to stay at our grandmother's during the summer to help out with chores and the livestock. They call it sheep camp. However, sheep camp was a summer lodge or cabin in the mountains where you took the sheep during the summer months to graze. Being from the city, I guess they just liked the term sheep camp when in reality, it was just our grandmother's permanent residence. Like most rural residents on the reservation, old automobiles and appliances that no longer worked piled up in the front yard due to a lack of transportation or waste management options. There was an obsolete refrigerator from the 80s on the far left side of my grandma's porch and a broken down muscle car from decades earlier. The car was more of a skeleton, a forgotten remnant, that rested about 30 feet far off to the left in perfect eyeline sight from the porch. The model of the car I cannot remember, but the windows had all been busted out and the upholstery was weathered and cracked. The desert sand had reclaimed most of it. The tires were shredded and half buried. If you grew up on the res, this served as a derelict jungle gym or playground. My mother and I had decided to visit my grandma one afternoon when I was 12 years old, the same age as my cousin. We greeted everyone upon our arrival and our grandma fed us. My cousin asked if I wanted to take a walk to the canyon and told me that he had something to tell me. He seemed urgent about it. As soon as we were out of earshot of any of the adults or his older brother, he told me that something had happened earlier that day at about 5.30 in the morning. Although it was summer, in the Arizona temperate desert, it is easily many degrees colder at night and early in the mornings. He told me that he was awoken by the urge to relieve himself. The sky was dark blue before dawn. He was half asleep and it was too cold to run all the way to the outhouse, there was no indoor plumbing. So he continued to say that he darted to the left to pee behind the old refrigerator and off the porch. His eyes were half closed and his mind was still a bit hazy from just waking up. Then he hears the distinct sound of something jagged and sharp scratching in long successions on metal accompanied by the heightened whimpering of a sheepdog. His eyes opened wide, and he tried to scan the horizon to locate the origins of the hurt sheepdog. Initially, he thought he saw the dog trapped in the car, but there were no windows or any glass obstructing the dog's escape from the wreckage. He witnessed the dog clawing and scratching to fight its way out of the window frame of the driver's side. Its front paws were clawing at the outer shell of the driver's door, making the sound of nails on a chalkboard. He finished urinating and dazedly took one step off the porch to help the dog out of the car. Suddenly, he freezes in his tracks. A cold, wicked laugh ripped through the early dawn air. His eyes immediately fixate on where the laugh originated from, also inside the car. He rubs his eyes and focuses his gaze on the dog, and his eyes follow along the dog's torso. Then he sees that something has its arms and claws wrapped around the waist of the dog, preventing it from escaping. At this point, the sun had inched and crept over the mesa and turned the sky from a pale blue to a pale yellow. The pale yellow light revealed that the driver's side of the car was completely covered in smeared blood. He jolts back inside and bolts the door behind him. 
He doesn't tell anybody because he was paralyzed with fear. Fear that if he talked about it, nothing would stop it from busting through the door and killing him, his brother, and our grandma. I inquired about what it looked like or if he even saw what had been holding the dog against its will. He said it looked like a werewolf, but a sickly one with mange. He noted that it was hairy, but you could see almost dry, cracked, gray skin underneath. He said before he ran, he slouched down to see what was holding the dog inside the car, and whatever it was, grinned. Its wicked smile was filled with sharp, jagged teeth, beaming from side to side. In all honesty, I thought he was lying to me to try to scare me, thinking I was some dumb, uncivilized rezzer who would believe a werewolf tale. We spent some time in the canyon playing on boulders and throwing rocks into the small stream. I had all forgotten what he shared with me until we made it back to my grandma's house. That's when he asked if I wanted to see the scene of the crime, so to speak. I was skeptical at the time, until we walked up to the car in question. I couldn't believe it. There were tufts of bloody, multicolored dog fur caught in the window frame, and bloody paw prints and smears on the outside of the driver's door. There were long scratch marks from the dog everywhere. Not sharp enough to cut through the metal, but enough to make a slight indent. As if the nails were scratching down with so much pressure that the protein from the nails, or whatever they're made of, buckled and gave way, filed down on the metal. I stood there in amazement and fear. All we did was throw dirt on the blood markings, and I haven't spoken of it until right now. Side note, the dog is okay. We spent all late afternoon looking for her. We later found her under an abandoned manufactured home on the property. She was afraid to come out for nearly two weeks, so my cousin said he always brought her food and water for the remainder of summer break. She's okay now though, fortunately. This happened to myself, my little brother, and my cousin when I was about 14 years old. It was just around dusk. We all lived in Tampico, Tamaulipas, Mexico. We decided to go play basketball at the outside courts. It was still daylight when we first got there, and we usually start heading home at about dusk or when the court lights come on. It was only a few blocks away from our grandma's house. When the lights come on, that's usually when the bigger kids get to the court to play. But this time we were fortunate enough to have the whole court to ourselves. We were shooting hoops like normal, nothing out of the ordinary, and the lights came on. But since we had the place to ourselves and we were having so much fun, we kept playing. The game was 21, so two of us would stand to the side of the hoop, depending on which direction the ball would go, so that it wouldn't roll into the street. And on one of these shots that my cousin made, the ball just missed the hoop and bounced behind it. I managed to grab it before leaving the court when I saw a strange creature. It was like a little person, no bigger than two feet. It had the face of a very old man with a fairly large nose, old ragged clothes that looked like they were handmade, and a hat that, I swear, looks like something a garden gnome would wear. You know, it was one of those pointy hats, but it wasn't straight up, it sort of hang down to the side. It was crouched down, almost like it was in hiding, and when I got too close to it, that's when it stood up, looked at me, and then ran away from me. Believe me, my first thought was not to chase it. I was scared stiff, but my cousin and little brother saw it too, and they ran. When it ran, it was headed for the other side of the court. I couldn't believe the speed of this thing. I mean, for it to be so small, it made it to the other side in mere seconds, almost the blink of an eye. It ran behind the post and was gone. I snapped out of it and I started to run home as well. And as I ran past that same post that this thing ran behind, I turned to look to see if it was there, but it was gone. When I got home, my little brother and cousin had already told the adults there what had happened. 
they didn't tell us we were crazy. In fact, they told us that these little creatures are called duendes. Apparently, there are different types of them too. So, I guess they're sort of a widely known creature where I live. I had never heard about them growing up, but that was my experience. You can believe me or not, but I hope you enjoyed the story either way. I live in the upper panhandle area of Oklahoma, and I've seen a lot of weird stuff in my day, some of which other family members can attest to. One such weird thing would be a shadow creature that I see whenever I'm with my uncle in the countryside. Oklahoma once housed Native American Indian tribes, and the remnants of these still remain. One of their legends tells about a shadow creature who will suck your soul from your body if you don't leave your shoes by the trees while camping. Personally, I've never been camping, so I wouldn't really know about that. But I have seen shadowy figures, and heard unexplained rustling and scurrying, and sometimes noises around me stop when I see these entities. I'm wondering if anybody else knows anything about this, whether this is exclusive to Oklahoma, or if anyone else has had these experiences in other areas. I don't really know what these figures or beings could be, but I do believe that sacred Indian ground has some pull when it comes to supernatural beings and occurrences, although I don't know where specifically the sacred ground would be. I had a rather odd encounter with some humanoid creature, or even a spirit possibly, just a few nights ago. I haven't been able to come up with a rational answer as to just what I saw. It happened just a few nights ago. I was biking home from work. I work the closing shifts for my local Walgreens, so I get off work around 10.30. I live only a half hour away by bike from my job but most of the way home is by a heavily forested trail, which doesn't have very many street lights. It's always pitch black when I'm on my way home. I'm about five minutes into this bike ride, and I hit the beginning of where the street lights end and the darkness begins. As I always do, I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight option so I could see. Only a few seconds after I turned it on, I tilted it up more and froze. I saw this tall, skinny, pale-looking figure for just a brief second before it fell onto all fours and, just like the wind, was gone into the woods. Shortly after, I started to pedal as fast as I could because I had no clue what I had seen and I didn't want to be in the same woods as it was. That's when I heard a low screech. Whatever it was was keeping pace with me, hidden in the woods out of sight. I managed to get out of that area very quickly, and I didn't see or hear anything after I left that heavily wooded area. But a while later on, I caught scent of what literally smelled like fresh blueberry pancakes or waffles. It was like somebody was standing out in the field with a hot plate of just the pan of blueberry pancakes, which didn't make any sense to me. There are no buildings or shops in the area where that scent came from. I figured that perhaps whatever it was I had seen was using the scent to try to draw me back into the woods. Now, I do know a few areas around that trail are supposedly haunted. There's a dinner theater that's not too far from it, and a supposedly haunted water tower in the area as well, and a few other places. But still, no matter what I can think of, I can't rationalize it or debunk it as something else. It couldn't have been a deer, because I've talked to people around the area, and no one has seen a deer in the area ever. Besides, it was standing on two feet when I first saw it, like a human. It couldn't have been any other wildlife, because the only wildlife I've ever spotted there are squirrels and birds. But I figured I would share my experience and see if anybody else has had something similar happen, 
or see if anybody knows what it is I saw. The other night, my mom and brother were outside taking the dog out. It was around 12.20 in the morning. She said that she saw something in the neighbor's yard, which is behind ours, walking in the yard. It was black and had a face like a gorilla, but slim. And it didn't look as big as the pictures of Bigfoot that supposedly people caught on camera. It was around six foot four to seven feet tall and walking very weirdly like it wasn't familiar with this area, or maybe even the planet. It was walking very sneaky-like, barely lifting its feet when it walked, kind of stretchy-like, and just looking forward. It didn't turn its head at all. She also said that she felt a very eerie feeling and that she's glad she trusted her intuition because she doesn't know what this thing would have done to her. Also, Way before that, she was taking a walk around the block, which is close to the woods, and she heard weird grunting sounds that didn't sound like any animal in our area, so I don't know what this could be. I wish I had more of an explanation or a description, but have any of you ever seen anything like this? I'm just going off the explanation from my mom, but she's pretty sure that she spotted Bigfoot. This happened when I was about seven years old to my uncle. He's no longer with us and I wanted to share his story. Growing up, I lived in Northern Michigan on 5,000 acres of farm and ranch land that backed up into state land. Nothing but miles of forest and pasture could be seen. Needless to say, it made us pretty tough and it takes a lot to spook us. We're all avid hunters, fishermen and outdoorsmen. Being the only girl, I was raised as a tomboy and I'm just the same. My uncle went off to join the military, becoming a senior NCO in a prominent special forces division of the U.S. Navy. He was 6'4", built like a wrestler, obviously skilled in survival tactics, and nothing rattled him. He was home on leave and went out hunting as it was deer season. I remember him coming in the house, shaking and crying, saying that he saw something in the woods. My uncle never cried. He was tough as nails and would tear someone to shreds before he let them make him cry. My grandmother tried to get him to make sense, but he kept saying that he saw Bigfoot mixed with the wolf. My granny immediately got my grandfather and he rounded up the rest of the guys. The hunting squad went out, which was my dad, a few male cousins, my uncle who was still terrified but didn't want to be labeled a chicken, and a couple of other guys. They all got their shotguns and ammunition and saddled the horses to go clear the woods. Apparently, they were aware of the dogman, but I was blissfully young and ignorant. They told me to stay inside and said that for absolutely no reason was I to step outside of our house until they returned. I had never heard my dad or grandfather so serious so I hid in my room. Sunset comes, and they still aren't back. I'm really worried at this point, because they've never stayed in the woods after dark. Shortly, I heard the sound of the horses running to the barn and their voices. I was so relieved. They looked troubled when they came into the house, but didn't say anything, probably not to spook me. At dinner, my dad laid down the law that I was no longer allowed to play outside or go to the barns alone. I had to have my grandfather with me at all times. Of course, I was pretty upset by this and felt that my independence was being taken away, but I obeyed. The next morning, my dad and grandfather taught me how to shoot. That's when I knew it was serious. I overheard the adults talking the next night. Apparently, there were tracks where my uncle had his sighting bigger than any wolf could make, but definitely not dog tracks. As I said before, we're all avid outdoorsmen, and we can definitely identify tracks. 
My family has identified the tracks of just about every animal in that area, and some outside of it, but these couldn't be identified. About eight feet up in a tree were claw marks. No Michigan bear could make those. We also found claw marks of about the same height on multiple trees throughout the property. There were cattle mutilated and not in any way that a coyote or bear would, and it lasted the whole winter. We lost about 30 to 40 cattle that winter, all of them mutilated, all with the same wolf dog tracks in the snow. I really feel like this experience changed my uncle. Who knows, he did multiple tours in the Middle East for Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom before unfortunately finally taking his own life. After that experience, though, he was never the same. He never touched alcohol before this. But after this, I never saw him without a bottle of Jack in his hand, and his eyes were always haunted. He changed his personality. He never even went out in the woods again. He quit hunting, and he eventually just quit coming home to visit on leave. He didn't even come home for my dad's funeral two years later. It was heartbreaking to see him deteriorate the way he did. I truly believe that he saw something out there, and while he might have gotten away that day, it ultimately killed him. I wanted to tell this story, but I never tell it to anyone else because I know they won't believe me, and I don't want to be labeled a liar or a crazy, but here we go. So about five, maybe six years ago, my friend and I snuck out of my house late one night. My house had a river behind it and a forest across the road in front. So we go out and walk around, smoking a cigar I stole from my dad. We walked around for about an hour. By then, it would have been around 3 a.m. As we got closer to my house, walking along the forest line, I turned to my friend and looked past him into the forest. About 10 feet past the tree line, I see this big, human-shaped thing with either no neck or a very muscular neck and big shoulders. It was looking out at us. I froze and said to my friend, do you see that? He looks over and starts running as fast as he can. So I did too. When we got back to my house, we called it an alien because we didn't know what else to call it. It didn't look human, although it was human shaped, but we didn't know what it was. It wasn't until about three years later that I told my brother and dad about it and I described it to them. It was big, about eight feet tall and had a black body with a gold color head. So my brother googles what I saw, and apparently something called Old Yellowtop comes up, described as a type of Bigfoot with a dark body and yellow head. What makes it even crazier is that all the sightings seem to be in Ontario, Canada, which is where I live. I think the first sighting is from the early 1900s. My friend and I are both about 20 years old now, and to this day, we swear that's what we saw in the forest. We're from a small town in southern Ohio, about an hour east of Cincinnati. This town has been plagued with people dying young and some in pretty gruesome ways. Google Cheryl Fossil as an example. Many believe that this is caused by activity around the area, or that it's the cause of the activity. There's a section of woods that seems to have concentrated activity though. The woods in question are surrounded by two churches, a hospital, and an area of housing. Now, as full disclosure, Things don't happen every time we go in, but when things do happen, they happen off the charts. The most common things that we've experienced are what we've dubbed the geeks. We call these things geeks because they're tall, 
sometimes twelve feet from toe to crown, and gangly. They move awkwardly, although they move between trees swiftly. They never present themselves outwardly, only glimpses of them as they move between trees. The scariest thing about them, however, is the sound right before they start moving. It's almost like a deep groan. The second that I want to talk about is Hydra. Only one of us have ever seen this thing, and so far has been the only one witnessed. It's like a small primate creature, with the face of a hideous woman, the body of a chimpanzee, and long greasy black hair with boils on its back, blood red boils. The member of our group who had encountered this thing refused to tell us what Hydra spoke to him about. These are some of the things that we've encountered. We're working on a documentary about what's going on in this area and the town itself. I'll keep everybody who's interested updated, but I really hope that somebody else has had similar experiences. We would love to find out what's going on in the woods. Two years ago, I went to visit my grandparents' place for the first time in years. It's a small town and the house is located on a hill, which extends to an open landscape. Anyway, it was night and everyone was either in the kitchen or bedroom watching TV. I had to go to the bathroom. They only have one bathroom and it's outside. So I make my way over taking my phone. I saw the neighbor's black dog that comes during the day to play with us and my grandparents' dog. Except it was weird for it to be outside at night. The whole property is surrounded by a concrete wall that has a tall, pointy metal fence on top of it. The only two gates accessible close or are locked at sunset. So there's no way that it could have entered since my grandparents and my visiting family all made sure to put all the animals in their place before locking the gates. The gates are always closed unless a visitor comes or to let my grandparents' dog go play on the open land outside the property with the neighbor's dog. But there were no visitors that day, and it was too late for them to be out playing. So I start making my way to the bathroom, and the dog appears from behind the bathroom building. It was wagging its tail and making these excited, low panting noises. You know, how dogs make when they're happy to see their owners. I start walking toward it and I see it gets all excited. It comes toward me and I'm petting it. Nothing was out of the ordinary. I just remember thinking how nice it was that this dog comes to play with my grandparents' dog. Then suddenly it starts walking away from me, back to behind the bathroom. So I go after it, thinking I'll call the neighbors and tell them that if they want to come pick up their dog, they can, or if they'll come pick it up in the morning, that's fine too. I just wanted them to know we had it. Their house is close to the bottom of the hill, which is about a 15 minute walk. And I wasn't about to walk alone in this town I don't know at that time of night. Halfway going after it, I get this weird feeling and I stop. I see it standing there, just staring at me. And being my dumb self, I take a few steps toward it, extending my hand and calling out its name. But the dog starts backing away slowly, not letting go of eye contact. That sends a red flag immediately, because the way it stepped back was weird, and the way that it wouldn't look away from my eyes creeped me out. It stepped back so slowly and into the dark. I turned my phone flashlight on, and scanned the light around. I couldn't see it. It was gone so fast, too fast. I was going after it because apparently I have no common sense, but just as I started walking forward, I hear this weird bark followed by one long howl. It wasn't exactly dog-like. I know because I've grown up with all kinds of dogs and that's not how dogs sound. It sounded wrong. I thought maybe it was hurt, so I ended up calling my dad to come search for it. We scanned every inch of the property, but no dog. Both gates were locked. I got really creeped out after that, and I couldn't sleep very well. 
and I kept hearing that weird howl all night. We checked in with the neighbors the next morning, and apparently their dog was with them the whole time. I seriously don't like my grandparents' place at night. It's creepy as heck. The whole town is surrounded by creepy stories. Even my dad has had some weird encounters with these weird cloaked people and strange lights where there shouldn't be any. I have to go back this year, and I'm kind of terrified. After she had surgery for kidney stones, my grandma became more sensitive about things. Exactly after the surgery, while she was still in the hospital, we both met in our dreams. She's seen me in her dream, and I've seen her in my similar dream on the same night. There's a lot to say about that too, but that's a story for another day. About a half a year later, she kept mentioning the little ugly people coming out of this particular flower pot in her apartment. According to her, they would come out during the nighttime or very early in the morning, just rising from the flower pot, walking a little bit around the room, and then going back into the flower pot and decreasing in size until the flower pot would swallow them. Bear in mind, this happened around 10 years ago. She told the entire family, and even though my mom and I are believers of the paranormal, we thought it might be age that was speaking in this case. Maybe she was hallucinating. Maybe it was sleep paralysis. But no, she kept insisting and insisting that she sees them every night. Then she kept giving us details. We suggested she might be dreaming and she would respond that she would get up and turn on the lights every time. They seemed to wake her up almost every night. On some nights, she would go to my grandpa in his bedroom. They were sleeping separately because they enjoyed the solitude and comfort. And she would wake him up and say, they're back. By the time my grandpa would come into her room, nothing was there. One night, she called my mom to say that they've woken her up again. She gave us a lot of details about these creatures, that they were small but quite ugly. That's why she named them the Little Ugly People. They were maximum one meter in height. They were weirdly dressed. Later on, she described them better, and I came to the conclusion that the fashion style would be around the 1800s. They also had hats. They were both male and female, and it was only one of them coming out per night, never more of them even though I do refer to them as plural. It seemed that they were struggling a bit to get out of the flower pot, and by implication, the flower, which was just a normal apartment plant. She tried to communicate with them every time, but with no success. They never hurt her, and they weren't doing anything to the objects in the room. They walked around the room, sometimes going to a different flower pot and disappearing there. There were times when she lost it and started screaming at them and telling them to leave her alone. One time she said she woke up and looked around and there was a tiny creature staring at her. Most of the time they were staring at her. Also, some of them had beards. We've searched for a very long time for any kind of reasonable explanation. Then we started to believe her and we searched for a paranormal one. I posted on a paranormal forum many, many years ago, and the answer I received was that they were gnomes visiting my grandma, and that she should not interact with them, as they might get aggressive and dangerous. They suggested putting rocks in a circle around the flower pot, and we did. I don't recall any other suggestion. This went on for more than a year. After about six months of quiet after we put the stones out, she started to forget things. Soon after, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, which she bravely battled for another two to three years. She's no longer with us, and I miss her, but sometimes I still meet her in my dreams. We started to think that maybe, since she ultimately was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she was hallucinating. But that doesn't explain why after we put the stones out, 
it stopped happening. Unless it was power of suggestion. Whether it was something medical or paranormal, it was still a really bizarre thing. And I'll never forget it. One of the more curious paranormal incidents in Georgia is the Georgia werewolf, Emily Isabella Burt. Apparently, Miss Burt was a resident of Talbot County, a rural county in southwest Georgia, between Macon and Columbus. The Burt family, a wealthy and prominent family in the Talbot County community, had several children. Of all of her children, it appears that Emily Isabella was the one with the most problems. For one, she had inherited a lot of physical traits from her father, including dark hair and bushy eyebrows. However, she was said to have had sharp, white canine teeth that made her smile quite disturbing. In one report, Roberts claims that Emily Isabella's mother took her to a local dentist to see if the teeth could be altered in any way, but he could do nothing for her. Soon afterward, she felt ill and suffered from restless nights. Emily is said to have strangely wandered the country during her restless nights. Legend has it that the beau of one of Emily Isabella's sisters, a William Gorman, reported to the birds that something was killing his sheep. Fearful that this may soon be happening to her animals, Mrs. Mildred Burt became quite concerned. On ensuing visits, Gorman would recount stories about more sheep killings and that some of his cattle were killed as well. He was concerned about the killings and decided to take action. He reported that he was going to be putting together what amounted to a posse. Their intentions were to shoot and kill whatever beast was doing the damage. Emily Isabella was unusually interested in what was going on and what events had transgressed in the hunt for this animal. On the night of the big hunt, Mildred Burt, who had also inherited more than a few guns and was a great markswoman, went out with her pistol. She apparently suspected that Emily Isabella was somehow involved with the killings and she wanted to be prepared for anything. As she was near the area, an animal lunged for her, and she fired. It ran away. Interestingly enough, the next morning it was reported that Emily Isabella had a bullet hole in her left hand. After being taken to a local physician, her mother decided to send her to Paris to be treated by a doctor who specialized in lycanthropy, a disorder that makes its victims think that they're werewolves. While she was in Paris, the attacks at home stopped, and, once she returned, supposedly cured, the attacks fell to a minimum. Emily died in 1911, and is buried in a small cemetery out in the wilderness of Georgia. To this day, a number of paranormal incidents are reported in that area, with the grave itself generally believed to be haunted by the ghost of the werewolf. People report a strange stillness or a sense of unease around the cemetery, and the grave itself is strangely well kept, even though the cemetery is overgrown and forgotten. Others have reported that when small tokens, like a chip of stone, are taken from the cemetery, bad things happen to those people not long afterward. There are even some people who note that even just speaking poorly of Emily or her family causes the same problems to happen as if the werewolf does not want anybody to speak ill of her. Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the whites for our inaugural overnight trip. 
While planning, my buddy Ellis figured that we could hike to a backcountry campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree. Beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked to say the least. Before any hiking trip, I do a little internet research on the trails or shelters that I'll be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness meant for backpackers or thru-hikers looking to escape the crowds in more popular areas of the forest. As time went on and the Forest Service had other, more pressing matters, many of these shelters were dismantled. Except for Dry River Shelter Number 3, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing with it a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility, so there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling along the river. Ellis and I made it up to the presidential ridge, stopping by the lakes of the clouds. The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers, all socializing together. We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the Dry River Valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled below the tree line down to the Dry River Shelter Number 3, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we entered the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparingly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared, and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud either. At least we would have some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to, just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit alongside a cold mountain river, pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, I found a small, bound notebook nestled into the corner of the structure. On the cover, somebody wrote, Dry River Shelter Number 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it, but I found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page and a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly enough, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of humans or even animals. No disturbance on the trails or here at the shelter. Rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of animal life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis, who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me that the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire along the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was, having not seen another soul beyond the chirp of birds since leaving the Crawford Path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life had desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to and I spent the night in my tent. Sleep came quickly after hiking over eight miles with 20 pounds on my back, but this did not last long. A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me. The only thing I could compare the noise to would be someone swinging a two-by-four into a tree or snapping a thick branch. I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again, and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks that the bear left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put it back where I found it closed and in the back corner of the shelter, not open on the floor. 
Hey, Ellis, I said. Were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, I passed out, man. It's not like there's anything to read in there anyway, he responded. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler, whose name was originally on the first page, could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what he was looking at. Great. Now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night. There's no way we missed all these names. How could we? Ellis said. This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. These sounds were not the result of some hooligans or backwoods crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he commented, It's a bear, Jack. It's just a bear. Let's go now. And, well, go we did. Ellis led us out of the sight and on to our way home, not ten minutes later. A year has passed, and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our stay at the Dry River Shelter Number 3. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind, I couldn't have mistaken it. Could I have mistaken the noises I heard and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Could we have just been too dehydrated and delusional? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the Whites for our inaugural overnight trip. While planning, my buddy Ellis figured we could hike to a backcountry campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree. Beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked, to say the least. Before any hiking trip, I do a little internet search on the trails or shelters that I will be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness, meant for backpackers or through-hikers really looking to escape the crowds in more popular areas of the forest. Though as time went on and the Forest Service had other more pressing matters, many of these shelters were dismantled except for Dry River Shelter Number 3, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead, and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing with it a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility, so there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling alongside the river. Ellis and I made it up to the Presidential Ridge, stopping by the Lakes of the Clouds. The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers, all socializing together. We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the Dry River Valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled below the tree line down to the Dry River Shelter Number 3, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we entered the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparingly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared, and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud either. At least we would have some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to, just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit alongside a cold mountain river. Pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, I found a small, bound notebook nestled into the corner of the structure. 
on the cover, someone wrote, Dry River Shelter Number 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it, but I found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page and a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly, though, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of humans, or even animals. No disturbances on the trails or here at the shelter. The rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis, who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me that the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire alongside the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was, having not seen another soul beyond the chirp of birds since leaving the Crawford Path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life had desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to and I spent the night in my tent. Sleep came quickly after hiking over eight miles with 20 pounds on my back, but this didn't last long. A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me. The only thing I could compare the noise to would be someone swinging a two by four into a tree or snapping a thick branch. I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again, and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks that the bear had left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put it back where I found it, closed and in the back corner of the shelter not open and on the floor. Hey, Ellis, were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, man, I passed out, he said. It's not like there's anything to read in it anyway. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler, whose name was originally on the first page, could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what he was looking at. Great, now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night, he said. There's no way we missed all these names. How could we? This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. These sounds were not the result of some hooligans or backward crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he said, It's a bear, Jack. It's just a bear. Let's go now. And, well, go we did. Ellis led us out of the sight and on our way home not ten minutes later. A year has passed, and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our night at the Dry River Shelter Number 3. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind. I couldn't have mistaken it. Could I have mistaken the noises I heard and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Could we have just been too dehydrated and delusional and saw the same thing independently? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? This past summer, my husband and I were invited down to a friend's cabin in Kentucky, not far from the Red River Gorge. We had so much fun during the week, going hiking and riding around on the four-wheelers, things like that. Saturday was no different, and we had an awesome day out in the sun with a nice dinner planned out that evening around the fire. We were setting up outside, and I was joking around with our friend about me believing in Sasquatches and how they like to tree knock. 
He humored me and found a two-by-four for me to knock against the trees. I excitedly knocked on the trees for a good bit until I was satisfied, but I didn't receive any knocks back. Soon, unfortunately, it started to rain, and I mean an absolute downpour that ended up knocking the power out. We got the generator running, lit some candles, and cracked some windows while dinner was cooking. Now, our friend had already told us that there were numerous Indian burial grounds on his property, and we were already in the midst of ghost stories. Dinner was soon done, and we were all eating around the table when I heard what sounded like someone talking right outside the back door. I immediately stopped eating and turned to the back door and asked our friend, what was that? He smiled at me and told me I knew exactly what that was from the stories he'd been telling us prior. I got up slowly from the table and headed to the back porch and sat down on the stool. I listened closely and the forest seemed to come alive. Amongst the whippoorwill calls, there were voices, drums, music, and soon after, there was whistling. Now mind you, his nearest neighbor was over a mile away, and they were an elderly couple, so there was no way that they would be making all this noise. My husband and our friend soon followed outside as well, and our friend recommends knocking on the trees again. I followed his direction and began knocking as loudly as I could. Still, there was no knock back, so I walked back up to the porch and sat on my husband's lap, listening to the music. The whistling continued, and we decided to humor it and to whistle back the exact same way that it had whistled. To our absolute nervous excitement, it began to whistle and pause, waiting for our response. We whistled back for a while and our friend decided to hit the hay with his wife. Not long after he decided to go inside, the whistling came to a stop, as well as the drums, music, even the birds had gone silent. It was the eeriest feeling I had ever had, and chills ran down my spine, when far off in the distance, we heard a loud, single knock on a tree. I opened my mouth in disbelief when a dragging sound broke the silence again. The sound was something heavy, dragging what I thought were its feet through the leaves on the ground. It started off by the front gate where the knock had come from, and kept getting closer and closer until it finally made its way to the gravel surrounding the cabin. My husband whispered under his breath, What is that? We shined our flashlight down the side of the cabin to see nothing. My husband pushed me out of his lap and, as a last chance to try to see what the sound was coming from, grabbed our friends to see if whatever this thing was would show up on thermal. We were frozen in fear, listening to this dragging noise approach where we were, and still we could see nothing. We were so scared we bolted inside. I've never seen my husband that terrified, and I've never been that terrified. Our commotion ended up waking up our friend, and he came out of his room to ask what was wrong. We told him what had happened after he went inside, and we told him that it was close to the side of the cabin. With the power still being out, we crept back to his room with the window still cracked, and we could easily still hear the dragging noise walking around the cabin. He built that cabin almost 20 years ago, and he had no words. He said he'd never heard that before and had no explanation. My husband had no words. I have never been so absolutely terrified, but yet excited in all my life. The next morning, I walked out onto the back porch, and the only thing that stood out to me was a single large footprint in the gravel. So, back in 07, I was eight years old. My grandparents and I lived up on a mountain in northern Georgia, in Floyd County, and our property was against the Bartow County line. 
It's a warm September night, just a couple of days after my birthday. I'm up in my room playing Call of Duty on my Wii, and my grandpa walks in and asks if I can take the trash out before it gets too cold. I say sure and pause my game and slip my shoes on. I walk out into the garage and open the garage door to throw the bag into my grandpa's truck. I turn on the light on the outside of the garage and walk to my grandpa's truck. Me being eight years old at the time, I was afraid of the dark, so I kind of sped walked and threw the bag in and hoped to make it. However, I did not make it, and I heard the bag land on the ground behind the truck. My head drops and my heart starts to pound for some reason, like I know that if I go behind the truck, something will get me. You know, the basic eight-year-old paranoia. So I run to the back of the truck, pick up the bag and toss it in, and turn around to go back into the garage when I see something. The way my driveway is, it turns off a gravel road, then curves to the left and up a hill. The hill smooths out a little bit, but doesn't level off completely. Right where the hill gets less steep, I see a dark figure just standing there. In the light coming from the garage, I can just make out its silhouette. It appears to be a person at first, but then my eyes adjust and I can vaguely make out hair covering its entire body. I stand there frozen with fear, like if I turn my back it's going to sprint up and get me. So I hesitantly walk backwards toward the garage while keeping my eyes fixed on it. And it seemed that every step I took, it took one also. I finally reached the hole where the garage door is placed and ran as fast as I could inside. When I got inside, I ran into the living room for my grandpa, and I say, Grandpa, get the gun. There's something in the driveway. It's big and it's walking on two feet. I don't know what it is, but it scares me. So my grandpa got the gun and we go outside on the front porch, which is a good 40 yards closer to the part of the hill that I saw it on. And it's not there. My grandpa says, you sure you saw something? I don't say anything. I just nod. He drops the gun from the shoulder and says, Come on, you haven't put the new trash bag in the can yet. We both turn around and walk back inside. Several hours go by and nothing else happens, until about 1 a.m. I wake up from having a nightmare of what I saw. I lay in my bed and look at my curtained windows, and I can see that the front porch light is on. I find that safer because it acts as a sort of nightlight for me. So I'm laying there looking at my window when I see a huge shadow walk right in front of my window on the outside. And I mean huge. The window sat about two feet off the ground, was about four feet tall, and was about two and a half feet from the ceiling. And this shadow was tall enough to cast a shadow big enough to where it looked like someone was sliding a wall past the window. I could hear the boards creaking out on the front porch and could see how wide this thing was from a side view. This thing, whatever it was, was at least two feet wide from the side, and it was absolutely huge. I didn't want to go get my grandparents because I didn't want them to get mad for waking them if there was nothing there. So I just watched this thing walk back and forth past my window. And before too long, somehow I fell asleep. Fast forward to the summer between my sophomore and junior year in high school. I had moved off the mountain, but was still going to the same school. Anyway, like a week before school got out, my best friend Kevin and I thought that it might be a good idea to go up to the mountain and to see if we could find this thing. Maybe it was still there. Without hesitation, I jumped at the opportunity. So the following weekend, after school ended, I met up with him and we brought some camping gear along with some food and a 30 odd six. I tell him we can camp out at the house that I saw this thing at, and he agreed that that was the best place to start. So we make it to the night and he's like, let's get out and walk around. I say, okay. So we both get out of the tent. I instantly felt like I was being watched. I shouldered the rifle and I felt the adrenaline filling my veins. Kevin put his hand on the barrel and lowers the end of the gun to the ground. Don't do that, he said. You'll make me nervous. So we start walking around the woods. 
We find some small game paths and hear a few noises, but we don't really find anything. So we both look at each other and decide it's not worth it, so we start walking back to the tent. This walk will take us at least about 30 minutes. On our way back, we can hear things in the woods that sound like tree knocks and whoops. We get about 100 yards from the property that we're camping out on, and suddenly a rock flies through the woods and lands within 10 feet of Kevin and I. Then it's like it just unloaded on us. Rocks were landing all around us with almost no time in between impacts. We hear all sort of whoops and hollers coming from different directions, almost like we were being surrounded, hunted. I tell Kevin to run, that I'd be right behind him. So we start running toward the property and hear the trees snapping behind us. I stop for a split second to raise the gun and fire a warning shot into the air. And then, all went silent. Kevin stops just in the clearing of the property and looks back at me. I looked back at him and we both run onto the property and book it out of there as fast as that pickup truck we drove would take us. I haven't been up there since and I don't intend to return. For some background, I live in the California foothills. My parents and I moved into this house from the city in late 2017, after it had been sitting empty for over a year. The day we moved in, my mother and I arrived first to clean while my father and brother drove the moving truck. Right off the bat, I was uneasy, but I tried to write it off. The property felt heavy is the only way I can describe it. Some people on here describe the feeling of being watched inside their homes, but I had that feeling any time I stepped outside. We were going to sweep and mop the floors, dust the baseboards and window sills, when I started noticing this white granular powder all along the baseboards and the window sills and the doorways. I immediately told my mother, who told me not to worry about it and just sweep it up. By the time I had swept up every room and cleaned off the window sills, I was certain that it was salt, and a lot of it. But fine, whatever. The people that lived here before were superstitious. All right, I can live with that. We unpacked the truck over the next week. I was setting up my room when the next bizarre events started happening. Knocking on the windows. Always quick raps that sounded like someone knocking with their knuckles. It would happen so often, on all the windows in the house, but when you would turn, no one would be there. You'd go outside, and no one would be around the house. This only escalated. My brother would stay up late in his room on his computer every night. He liked to game with his friends until early in the morning. He does not spook easily, but on more than one occasion I would wake up to him shaking me awake, terrified saying something massive on two legs was walking around outside his bedroom window, which he would have open at night. He said it would walk right up to his bedroom window and stop, and when he would look toward the sound, he could hear it scrambling away. I never saw it with my own eyes, and neither did he, but the motion lights outside would be activated every single time, leading to the woods near the back of our property. I know what you're probably thinking. All of this up to this point can be explained away rationally. A crazy person living in the woods, some neighbor messing with us for whatever reason. Well, that was what I told myself too, so I could sleep a little easier at night. And then the banging started. It was so loud, and it would sound like it was coming from everywhere at once. The walls would literally vibrate, picture frames rattling right off the walls. It was like something massive, stronger than any crazy person, was pounding on the exterior walls of the house, always late at night, and always in more places than just one. I could never pinpoint the source directly. My brother and I would stumble out of our bedrooms petrified, and my mom would lead us to her room where we would stay after that. 
My dad would walk the perimeter of our property with his gun, but he never found anything. No footprints, no people, nothing. This happened for probably six months, and every time a major event would happen, my dad would walk the perimeters with his rifle and come back with nothing. We felt like we were going insane. And then, suddenly, it just stopped. The mutilated animals stopped appearing. I stopped feeling like I was being watched any time I would go outside. My dogs stopped being so on edge any time I took them out. And the property itself seemed to get lighter, like it finally took a deep breath after holding it for so long. I genuinely have no explanation, or even a clue as to what that creature, being, or entity even was. I'm just glad it seems to have moved on. Hopefully it didn't stop, because it moved in. I haven't really spoken to anyone about this, other than my boyfriend and his brother. His brother gave off the impression that he thought I was crazy, and laughed it off. So I've not said anything to anyone since. It's been driving me crazy ever since I saw it. This happened in March of 2021. Where I live in England, there's a lot of countryside. At the time it happened, I was driving down a small country road that was parallel to a main road. Just a large field and bush on the other side next to the main road to separate them. I was talking to my boyfriend, and I noticed this very tall human-like figure at the side of the road. It was extremely skinny, like it was skin and bones and nothing else. It didn't appear to have any clothes on, it had pale skin, and it looked really unhealthy. I didn't really see its face, but from the quick glance I got, it looked like it had indistinguishable facial features like it had been blurred in Photoshop or something. It crossed the road onto the field in front of me extremely quickly, and then disappeared into an open field. I slowed right down and looked back into the field. It was mid-evening, so it was getting dark, but you could still see. There was nothing it could have hid behind. The grass was too short to hide in, and there was no way that any human could have ran the entire length of that field to the bush on the other side in such a short amount of time. Whatever it was, just vanished into thin air. My boyfriend told me to stop the car, but I was terrified and everything in me told me to continue driving, so I never stopped to check it out. I'm not sure whether that was a mistake or not. I don't know why it's terrified me so much, but I can't stop thinking about it and it's driving me crazy. I'm searching for an explanation. I know it may be unlikely, but has anyone else ever seen something like this? If so, do you have any idea what it was? My only explanation is something paranormal. If it were human, how did it just vanish like that? I would love to know. So here's my story. I always thought that I believed in these kinds of things, but now that it's happened to me, I'm trying my hardest to rationalize it away. Unfortunately, I can't. I just want to start off by saying that I am 37 years old, and I have never experienced anything like this in my life, and I hope never to experience it again. This happened three days ago. It was 11.30 at night, and I was taking my dog out to go to the bathroom. My boyfriend and I live on about four acres of land. We have an overgrown field in the distance. It's somewhere near the house, but not super close. I was carrying one of those spotlight flashlights. It's so powerful that you can see the beam shoot through the night sky. My dog and I were getting close to the field, so I decided to scan it with a flashlight. What I saw next still terrifies me. I saw this creature walking through the field. It had a human-shaped head, but the eyes were nothing like I had ever seen. 
They were so big that it took up a majority of its face. They glowed in a way that I have never seen. It was a piercing glow. I know that flashlights can create a certain type of reflective glow, but this was different. It was almost like the light was shooting out of its eyes. I live in a wooded area, so I have come into contact with many animals at night. This was not a set of eyes like I've ever seen on any animal here. It's weird because I don't recall seeing a mouth, but that could have been because I was so fixated on its abnormally large eyes that I wasn't paying attention to its lower face. Its eyes had this shocked but evil look to them. That expression really stood out to me because it was so eerie. Now let's get to the body. It was somewhat human shape, but it had abnormally long extremities. Even though the overgrown field covered some of its body, I could still tell the shape of it. The arms were too long for its body. I checked out how tall the overgrown grass was the next day, and based on that I estimated that the creature was about six feet tall. The way it walked terrified me. It was facing me and walking sideways while staring at me. I have to admit that I got so scared I lowered the flashlight to the ground, but then I got the nerve to raise it back up after a few seconds. It had made its way down the field a little more, but it was still walking sideways and staring at me with those horrifying eyes. Needless to say, I took my dog inside after that and had a mini freak out. I've done a lot of research online, and I cannot figure out what that thing was. I just know that it wasn't an animal or a human, and I hope that I never see it again. In 2001, a couple of days after my mother gave birth to my brother, she brought him home from maternity. I was seven at the time. My brother's cot was in my parents' bedroom, right next to their bed. That first night of my newborn brother being home, my dad was working a night shift, so I went to sleep next to my mother, as I usually did when my dad would be working nights. Around two or three in the morning, my mom and I both wake up at the same time and look at each other, confused as to why we woke up, realizing that my brother was still fast asleep. Or at least wasn't crying or making a noise. We listened for any other noise that might have woken us up, but nothing. Not a minute later, this whooshing loud noise fills the room and we feel a strong breeze or wind. Then we hear the whooshing sound again, this time closer to my baby brother's cot. My mom jumps out of bed, freaking out that somehow the window was left open and a bird got in. Now that whooshing sound was exactly like wings flapping, but it was more like massive wings were flapping, not a regular bird. And the gust of wind it created was also massive. Lights go on, my brother is awake now, but was not scared by the noise or the wind. He was just kind of looking around. My mom starts looking for birds when I point out that the window is in fact closed. She still makes me get up and have a look around with her for anything that could explain it. We had a chat afterwards about it and she told me that as soon as she got over the shock, she heard a voice telling her, it's okay just as she was about to check up on my brother. In the moment, she assumed I was trying to calm her down. But when I denied it, she realized that the voice didn't sound like me at all. I also heard the it's okay, and it sounded genuinely reassuring. It's worth adding that we heard and felt the winged thing come, but we never heard or felt it leave. We stayed up the rest of the night, waiting for something else to happen, but it never did. While the noise and all scared us initially, we both felt relaxed, relieved, content, and happy all at the same time. It's hard to describe the feeling. 
Mind you, the whole thing happened in like 10 seconds, but that weird feeling stayed with us the rest of the day. When my dad came home and was told the story, he was genuinely worried, and my mom just told him that it's okay, he has nothing to worry about. At his puzzled look that my mom hadn't joined him in being worried, she just said, trust me, I have a good feeling about this. Now, I don't know why she said it like that, but at the same time, I completely understood it. It's been a long time since this happened, but it's still very clear in both mine and my mom's memories. I have tried to look this up through the years, but came up empty. I would love to get an idea of what it was. This is a story from when I was growing up in Northern Kentucky in the 90s. I would have been right around 10, maybe a little older. I'm in my 30s now, but I vividly remember this happening and I still think about it all the time. My best friend lived with his grandparents for a bit on several acres of land in Walton, Kentucky, and I spent almost every weekend there. They never really did much with the land. It remained relatively cleared, but there were no farms or structures on it. They had a horse stable near the house, but that was it. My friend had received a go-kart for his birthday, so we were out driving it around on the open land. It was just the two of us, and we were having a blast riding this thing around. It was getting close to dusk, and we knew we were going to have to pack it in pretty soon. We came to a stop, and the engine cut out, and almost at the same time, both of us had this really strange feeling come over us. We felt like we were being watched by something. It's weird how our lizard brains can still even process something like this, but we both agreed that there was just this weird, overbearing feeling. We hadn't heard his grandpa's truck, and we were too far out to be seen from the house, so we started looking around. We were in an open field in the middle of their land, and it was surrounded by trees and tall brush. But something caught my eye first, and I got my friend to look in that same direction. In the brush, we could see a long, almost black shape sitting very still. I know at this point in the story, most of you are thinking Bigfoot. I can say I remember things being dead silent. Even now, I sometimes wonder if it was something else we saw. But all I remember is thinking that it was a giant black wolf. I would guess it was maybe 200 feet away from us. And it was sitting perfectly still. But to me anyway, it looked furry. I couldn't make out any other features, like ears or eyes. But I swear, this was what was making us feel watched. It's like when you see a cat getting ready to pounce. That's what it felt like when we were looking at this thing. We were both getting really spooked at this point. The sun was getting down low behind the tree line, and one of us was going to have to jump out and pull start the engine back up. We were whispering about what it was that was watching us. Honestly, I forget which one of us jumped out and started the cart back up, but when we looked back at where the black shape had been, it was gone. The go-kart didn't have any lights, so we drove as fast as we could back to his grandparents' house and we told them what we saw. His grandpa said we probably just saw a coyote or maybe a boar, but this shape was long and low and, I don't know, Coyote and boar, they just don't sit well in my head with what I saw. Not to mention it was pitch black and very furry. Every few years I think about this story, and I've read that there are no wolves in Kentucky anymore. I think I've just convinced myself it was a coyote or something, but the memory has stuck in my head all this time. Nothing else ever happened on his grandparents' land aside from a really bad car accident a few years later, and some missing chickens, but again, a coyote would explain that. And every once in a while, the horses would get really riled up at night. We would go camping on the land and fishing a lot, and we had a lot of fun around there. Anyway, this is my short little spooky story. I wish it had more bite to it, but it's 100% what happened. What do you think we saw?
My grandfather lived in a very rural area in Nepal, and most of the people were farmers, so was he. Since there was no automated water system, they would have to take turns to switch water to their land, and sometimes this would happen at night. One night, there was a full moon, and even though it was midnight, everything was visible with the naked eye. As usual, he went to the farm to switch the water flow from one section to another. Everything went as normal, and he sat down for a quick smoke session. He saw a small baby goat near the farm, which was very strange because there were no houses anywhere near, and it's not normal for goats to just roam around by themselves. He thought he would take it to the village and whoever it belonged to could claim it in the morning. He has the goat on his back and his hands are grabbing onto its legs. He was walking up the hill when suddenly he hears a whisper. Such a pretty moon, making the night so beautiful. The goat talked like a human being. He threw the goat to the ground and started running up. He looked back as he was crossing the hill and there was no goat. He ran all the way home and he told us that he smoked the whole packet of cigarettes and didn't sleep all night. Last night, I woke up at around 2 a.m. I heard this soft yelling and was confused at first as to why somebody was out. Then, as I listened more, I realized there was a pattern to it. I wanted to get up to the window and see who was making that sound, thinking that they may just be a drunk person walking around the parking lot. But there was this overwhelming sense of dread that came over me, like if I looked outside, I would be drawn to go outside, and if I went outside, I would never come back. This rhythmic whooping continued on for easily 20 minutes and then stopped altogether. It was not an animal. I know this for sure. I've had paranormal experiences before, so maybe I'm easily spooked, but I think I was being lured outside. And even though it sounded human, I didn't get up to look. Now it's the morning after and I can't shake this feeling. Does this sound familiar to anyone else? Some kind of hunting practice for a known humanoid or cryptid? As a note, I live in an area of owls and wild birds and I hear them consistently throughout the week. I know what they sound like. I don't have coyotes or any big cats in my area. I listen to owls outside my window often, and I can tell you that this was something different. I don't know how to explain it, but it almost sounded like a human trying to imitate an owl. I only immediately dismissed it as being a wild animal because it was so unlike anything I've ever heard. I would love to know what it could be. As a kid, maybe 11 years old, I was once in the forest looking for lost things. Then I came across a small pond, really a small pool in the forest. A woman was standing in the water. The water reached her knees. She was looking to the other direction and I couldn't see her face. She had white hair and some old looking clothes. They looked extremely old fashioned. She didn't turn to me, and she didn't move at all, but I could see her breathing. I came closer, and then she left the water and stood on the forest ground. As she was raising her feet from the water, I saw that her feet were backwards. I was shocked, frozen, but I freaked out and finally turned around and began to run. As I was running, I looked back and I could see her face. She was looking at me with this evil grin and an extremely pale face. 
I went home and told the story to my parents, and of course, they did not believe me. I've never forgotten this encounter, and I was wondering if anybody else had any accounts of people having backwards feet. I went to this forest multiple times afterwards with my friends, never alone again, but I couldn't even find the pond, let alone the woman, anymore. The closest thing I have found on the internet is the saguaba. As soon as I saw a picture of one, it gave me chills. The woman I saw looked exactly the same, but she was extremely pale. Everything else looks the same though. I'm fairly certain that this is what I saw, but I'm also open to any other ideas. It was around 10 o'clock at night, off a little ways from Ocean City, Maryland. It was mother, her boyfriend, my sister, and I. We were driving home from our vacation, and I asked if we could take the back roads. I always loved seeing the woods at night, and it was the scenic route. We were driving down, and although I was the one who asked for the trees, I was on my phone, texting and listening to music. We eventually came to a stretch of road that I didn't pay much attention to. It was boring, but I occasionally looked up every now and then as I'd had the entire ride. It was a straight path forward with nothing but street lights. So we were driving and driving and as we crossed under the lights, it was almost relaxing. I went into a half sleep trance. Then I suddenly woke up and everything was fine. More lights as we drove by. No one was talking. My mom's boyfriend wasn't asleep, but there were no muffled conversations. Everything seemed calm. But I had this sudden awareness. We were in the middle of the woods. It was dark and around 11.30 to midnight, and without the streetlights, you couldn't see anything but the stars. I immediately felt a very paranoid vibe and turned my phone on and listened to music. Then we entered back on another streetlight stretch, and we drove on. The strange part is, it's almost like something told me to go on my phone, as if there was a notification, but I checked and nothing was there. When I did this though, I noticed something in my peripheral. There were about four lights up ahead that were turned off, in an area where the road kind of turns. This was a fairly wooded area and you couldn't see much without light so we slowed down. I didn't pay much attention to it, but this next part sticks with me. As we slowly approached the next light that was on, something crawled out from the woods and into the light. I looked up and thought it was a deer at first, but it kept moving out. It was limping, but when it was fully emerged, what I saw was truly bone chilling. A naked, ash-white, skinny man crawled out on all fours. It stopped, and as I saw it, it turned its head toward us. Its eyes were a deep charcoal black. We sped up fast and started driving. It was not human. As we drove past it, it jumped over our car, weightlessly, defying physics. My mom's Mercedes had two sunroofs, and although it was a blur, I got a close look at it. As it passed over the car, it landed behind us and faded into the black. The scary part was, when it jumped over our car, the sunroof was open. I'm glad we got out of there. It was the summer of 2010, and I was still in high school. My friend's dad invited me with his family to go camping near a lake that was a Native American reservation at one point. We get to the campsite, and my friend and I start experiencing weird things. 
We got chased by a swarm of ghost bees, and we just started to feel like it wasn't safe to be by ourselves. There was a shaman who was going to tell stories around his campsite, and he was inviting campers to come by that night and listen. When night came, I had to walk a ways to the public restroom at the campsite. I get to the restroom, and a guy comes running out, screaming that there are hornets in the bathroom. I was scared of stinging bugs, so I decided to go in a bush that was about four yards away from the restroom. I start peeing, and I start hearing rustling coming from the bush. I shine the flashlight, and... He has darkish skin with white face paint, and he's almost half naked. I jumped back and I screamed, and I scraped my elbow. A nearby camper ran over to help me, and I told him that I saw a man crouched in the bushes. This dad-like figure shines his flashlight into the bush and dives into the bush. Now, all this happened in a matter of minutes. From me seeing the guy and screaming and the other guy coming to help me, I probably only looked away for a second, but when the guy jumped into the bush, he stands back up and he's holding a rabbit. The guy also found burning sage. He told me what sage was because I didn't even know what it was at the time. He put the rabbit down and told me it was just my imagination, or that if I was being truthful, the guy ran away and I shouldn't go alone to the bathroom anymore. I go back to my campsite and my friend's dad asked me what took so long. I didn't tell him what happened. He then tells us that he wants all of us to go to the shaman's camp so we can hear the stories. So we go to the campsite and this guy was dressed to the nines. Headdress, necklace, feathers, white face paint, and no, he was not the guy in the bushes. The shaman was probably in his 40s and he said that his father taught him everything he knows. He told us the history of the lake and that it was his people's land and that we took it from them. Literally being honest as can be and not sugarcoating it for the kids. We killed them and turned their home into a lake and that his ancestors' bones are in that lake. He then starts telling us about native legends and he starts talking about skinwalking. He told us that some people in these tribes were so in tune with nature that they could take on the form of other animals, mainly coyotes or dogs, but they can shift into other animals too. I was starting to feel genuinely spooked, and after his whole get-together ended, I told him about what I saw in the bush. He grabbed me by the shoulder and took me to his trailer and told me to wait outside. He came out with a single red feather and looked at my elbow and told me that I was wounded in battle and that this feather will show the skinwalkers that they should respect me and they will leave me alone. I didn't know what to do, so I took the feather and as I walk away, he shouts, they don't show themselves to everyone. I slept pretty good that night and the rest of the time we stayed after I got that feather. But like the dumbass kid that I was, I didn't treat it with respect, and I lost the feather not soon after I got back home. I wish I still had it. I'm not saying that skinwalkers exist, but the shaman seemed to take what I said really seriously, and I wanted to share my experience. I actually overheard this on the news a few years back, about a cryptid in Kentucky. It's a feline-like creature, said to look like a mountain lion mixed with some sort of monstrosity. I didn't really think much about it until my friend, we'll call him Bran, told me what he saw when he was deer hunting. It was pretty late and he and his dad were about to pack up. They heard a low growl near them. His dad told him to get back up in the hunting perch. I'm not a hunter by any means, so don't crucify me for not knowing the correct lingo. Bran did and watched through his binoculars to watch for what had made the growl or for his dad to give him an all good. He watched for what he said might have been 10 to 15 minutes when movement caught his eye. 
He tried to get a better look when he saw the weird creature that I mentioned earlier. It scared him so badly that he froze. He thought it was just a mountain lion or a bobcat, but it had four eyes. His dad managed to distract it off by startling a nearby doe. It left chasing its newfound prey. He and his dad waited until they couldn't hear it and then booked it back to their truck. He was pretty shaken up the whole week after. I felt bad for him. However, this wasn't his only run-in with a cryptid or a strange creature. Despite being underage, he still does a lot of dangerous or stupid things, such as drinking and driving, smoking cigarettes, and other really dumb things. He's not shy about it either. Well, he'd been doing that first one, but wasn't totally drunk yet, and his best friend, we'll call him Dave, was taking a joy ride with him on some back roads, which aren't hard to find in our region. They were messing around, having a good time, blaring music, you know, teenager things. He was focusing on the road, listening to a story Dave was telling him, when he saw a strange, pale, humanoid, quadrupedal, fleshy creature with visible teeth and large black eyes run out onto the road. Bran hit his brakes and just barely missed it. It screeched at him and ran off into the woods on the other side of the road. Bran and Dave sat there trying to process what had happened and if what they both saw was real. They stopped drinking and went straight back to Dave's house, where they proceeded to freak out. They told me this story too as I sat next to them in a couple of classes. While I asked them to describe the creature to me, as I'm known for researching and collecting information on cryptids, urban legends, and monsters, and they felt I could help. After they gave me the description, I came up with a list of possible creatures and showed them art and, quote, real pictures of them on Bran's phone. Once we got to Wendigo's, Skinwalkers, and the Rake, they showed clear signs of distress. I pulled up one of the well-known Rake pictures and showed it to them. I thought Bran was going to have a heart attack. He yelled, that's it. It has to be. It's almost dead on. Dave scrolled through the related pictures and found a different photo and quietly showed both of us. Bran then fell silent. They both said that that was it. That was the creature they nearly hit. I told them that they had to be bullshitting me because the rake is a creepypasta. I told them the story and what it's known for and that they were not proven to be real and were in fact very likely fake but they insisted that that's what they saw. They thanked me and asked me if there was a way to protect themselves if it came for them. I told them I didn't know, but fire was probably the best route if it actually was real. They haven't had any experiences since that I know of, but it did freak them and me out a good amount. I was glad I could help them, but now I'm terrified of the woods, more than I previously was, and I question more and more if these legends are just legends. I already believed in a few, but it's just terrifying to think that more of them could be real. I've told a story before about living in a flat where this thing that I called the Whistler always came by. I had other experiences in this flat too, and this one thing has to be the worst by far. It's hard to describe the sense of dread and fear that this thing gave off. It honestly felt like my life was at risk and my whole body would scream to run. Anytime I would hear this thing, I was alone, which of course just made it all worse. One night, the dog was barking outside, so I got up and went out to look. As I was looking outside, the dog went back in and left me alone, standing in the dark next to the shed. I soon became aware of noises in the shed, but put it down to the wind. That is, until I moved closer, and I felt a strong sense of dread. I listened to the sound. It sounds like a person on all fours scuffling around. I heard it move toward the shed door, so I ran inside and slammed the door. I sat down and tried to tell myself that it was still just the wind. At first, the dread was going away, 
but then I could feel it building up again. It felt like it was trying to find a way in, moving back and forth along the walls of the house. Then, I suddenly felt it inside the apartment. It had gotten into the kitchen. I'm not quite sure how. The window, maybe. I could feel it getting slowly closer. I was too scared to look behind me into the kitchen, but I managed to jump up and slam the door. I hoped it would leave, and it did. After this, I would hear it sometimes, just scuffling around at night. The alley at the back was dark and smelly, so I assumed it liked it. Now this next bit is truly a fault on my own part. I really should have listened to my own gut feeling. It was months later. It was summer and therefore very warm, so I had the back door open. I was on my laptop and it had gotten dark. At some point, I turned the light on and sat back down. I sat facing the back door. My laptop screen stopped me from seeing the bottom half of the door. After a while, I started to hear movement outside and felt uneasy, but I told myself that it was nothing. Yep, I just sat there and told myself I was being stupid. But the feeling grew stronger and stronger, my whole body screaming at me to run. Then, our dog comes running downstairs, stops in the middle of the room, looks at me, and then goes to walk outside. The way she did this was just... odd. I pulled down my screen and watched her head toward the back door. As she walked out the back door, there was this... thing. Some humanoid figure crouched down by the door. Its skin was dark brown, like dirt and rot and had texture like it'd been burned. It was hairless and skinny, like it hadn't eaten in months. There it was, this thing I had been in fear of for so long, right up against the door frame, trying to make its way inside. The figure twisted its emaciated form round to follow our dog. It was crouched down onto its hands and feet. That's why it was making the scuffling noise. I jumped up and threw my laptop to the floor. I ran upstairs and refused to go back down alone. The stupidest thing was that I doubted myself, and if it wasn't for the dog, then I don't know what would have happened. Her look toward me when she came downstairs. I can only imagine she was wondering why I wasn't running away. A friend told me it sounded like a skinwalker, and that Europe does have accounts of such things, but I don't know. I don't know what that thing was, but either way, I'm so happy that we moved. I've had a long history of paranormal things happening to me, but these take the cake. I lived in the middle of Hicktown swamps in Georgia when these took place. When I was 13, I ran away from home for personal reasons. I booked it to a local nature trail in the middle of a wildlife reserve. I ran down it about 15 minutes, and a hand reached out from the bush to my right and hit me in the chest. I got back up and looked for my attacker, but there was nothing there. I proceeded to run home crying like a real man. When I was 15, I was laying in bed, scrolling through creepypasta articles, when I hear a sort of rhythmic tapping on my window. I freak out and pretend I can't hear it for a while, until I can't stand it anymore. I pull the curtain back. It's only a raccoon. I hit the window and scare him off and try to calm myself down. About a half an hour later, the same tapping the same rhythmic pattern. Kinda like click, click, scratch, click, click, scratch. So I decide I'm gonna get my BB gun and take it out on the raccoon, scare him, you know, so he won't come back. So I grab my BB gun, I open the window, I take aim, and there's this shadowy figure that resembles a man staring right at me, right on the border of my lawn that connects my yard to the huge expanse of woods around my house. And it just stares at me 
and slowly walks into the woods behind it. After that, I didn't sleep for about a week. In fall of last year, on a walk down the nature trail with two of my friends, Antoine and Justin, we were just cracking jokes and drinking. It was 4 a.m. and we were just having a great time. On the walk back home, I feel this awful presence. I look behind me and I see something at the end of the trail in the distance. My vision isn't the best, but from what I could tell, it looked like a man with a deer head as his own. So I looked away. I told my friends not to say a word until we got home. Justin knew of my past occurrences and he doesn't really mess around with paranormal stuff. So he listened and just kept walking. But Antoine just looked at me for like 15 minutes while walking perfectly straight. I freaked out and started doing the strangest movements of my arms to see if he would mimic them. And every time he would. At one point, I locked both my arms and put them on my head, and he did the exact same thing. I was ready to just leave him in the woods that night, honestly. Eventually, he screamed something completely unintelligible, and it scared the crap out of me, so I threw a punch at him and he dodged it. I apologized, told him to shut up, and then told them all to run home with me. When we got there, we discussed what we had seen and what happened and Antoine said that he completely blacked out as soon as we started walking the nature trail, only to wake up to me throwing a punch at him. About two months ago, another thing happened, and this was where I drew the line. I've moved since this incident, and I honestly don't plan on ever going back. I was walking down the nature trail again. Clearly, I hadn't learned my lesson. I was listening to music, having a good time, and this thick, permeable smell of blood hit my nose. I genuinely thought I had a nosebleed for a second, until, through my headphones, I hear somebody talking. I take off one of my headphones and have a look around. Nothing. Speed walking out of there, it happens again. And this time, it sounds exactly like a man screaming, Warbringer! Instantly, I'm on the verge of tears. I jerk back and look around as fast as possible, and I see it. There's a fully naked man, resembling more of a corpse than a man, with a bleeding, rotting horse's head. His arm was extended out toward me. I ran home and packed my things. Now, by this point, I have so many theories as to what happened, but I hate indulging them. They all scare the hell out of me. My current idea is that I'm just nuts. I'm not sure, but whatever the case is, if there's anyone here who can explain what I saw, I'm very open to it. My mom, my mom grew up near northern Wisconsin, and she told me some stories a while back which happened to her, her brothers, and others in their area, and I feel that some of them are worth mentioning. I've had my own paranormal experiences, which I feel are quite difficult to talk about, and I've talked about a few of them on Reddit. But for now, I want to tell you another one of my mom's stories. One of the stories my mom told me was something that had happened to a family that had apparently lived nearby them. There was a family driving through the forests and eventually their car broke down. This would have been in the 70s or 80s before cell phones were widespread. So they ended up getting out of their vehicle and making the journey home on foot. Eventually, however, they started to notice sounds from behind them as if something was following them through the woods, or perhaps more aptly put, stalking them through the woods. When they ran, it ran. When they stopped, it stopped. Eventually, they were able to get to their house and they quickly entered, slammed the door and locked it. Whatever was following them let out a bellowing scream. Apparently, the family had alerted my grandfather as to what had happened and told him to look into his fields. 
According to my mom, he had apparently come back into the house, wide-eyed and alarmed, but he didn't elaborate on what he saw. I vaguely recall my mom talking about him seeing some sort of glow in the field, though. I'm unsure if it's related, but my oldest uncle went horseback riding with a friend, and they apparently came across this thing. Apparently, it was white and furry. And, when it saw my Uncle Mike and his friend, it stood up on its hind legs, bounded over a fence, and ran off. Apparently, it left behind some fur, which my uncle apparently collected, but this would have been many, many years ago, and my uncle died when I was about four years old in a bad accident, so I'm unable to ask him about the story. I'm unsure if both of these stories are related or not, and there could be some natural causes to these things. Black bears, wolves, dogs, etc. All would be living in the area. However, judging by the tone of the story, and the fact that such animals are rather commonplace and it was apparently during the day, I'm not sure if it would have been mistaken identity or not. What does interest me, though, are the stories of the Wendigo, Skinwalkers, and the Wisconsin-Michigan Dogman. Could it be related if it was not a case of mistaken identity? I don't know, and I don't really care to find out either. Just be careful in the woods. Mother Nature can be a cruel mistress, and there is darkness in the world, be it supernatural or the very, very real depths of human depravity and cruelty. Protect yourself and your loved ones. Back about 10 or so years ago, my good friend and I would occasionally take trips to her family's property out in the middle of nowhere. It was fairly remote. You had to drive up a dirt road a few miles and couldn't access it unless you had a key to the chain on the gate. There wasn't anyone around for miles. All that was there was a trailer that they had towed up and left to sleep in. The feel out there was always a little off. One day, we were wandering around the property. We didn't think much of anything until about 20 minutes later, when we realized we had actually been walking out into the middle of nowhere. We had no water with us and had no clue where we were. Luckily, we found our way back after a while, but neither of us could explain why we did that. I'd also take my voice recorder, and we caught quite a few strange things on that. One day, before heading out there, we were talking about Skinwalker Ranch. It was only about a 40-minute drive from the property. So we thought, hey, why don't we go and try to find it? We thought it would be cool to say we had been there. After searching the internet, we found fairly good directions there and headed out for the night. We had a bit of trouble locating it. But after a bit of driving around, we pulled up into an area that was spot on from the descriptions we had read. We stepped out of the car, and the first thing we noticed was the massive amount of bugs swarming around us. Only a few short seconds later, we heard huge dogs barking, growling, and then saw them running at us. We immediately jumped back in the car and took off. We ended up staying in the general area for a little while longer, just exploring. Later that night, back at her property, we were sitting around the fire talking. All of a sudden, we start hearing barking. It was rather startling, and she immediately froze and said that she had never heard barking in the area before. She isn't one to get scared easily, so her uneasiness put me on edge. Not too long after that, there was more barking. Very slowly, we were being surrounded by what I assumed were coyotes. We both tried yelling, jumping around, throwing rocks, but it didn't seem to do any good. I had never known coyotes to act this way. We were terrified and had no clue what to do. Not really wanting to stick around and find out if they would get any closer, we doused the fire and flipped on our flashlights. She grabbed my hand, and we booked it into the trailer. 
We were both shaking by the time we made it in, and she locked the door. I don't think either of us slept that well. I heard a lot of weird sounds and felt a sense of dread the entire night. As soon as the sun started to rise, we decided to pack up and get out of there. We neared the car, and what we saw sent chills down my spine. On the driver's side of the car window was a huge handprint made with mud. It was easily twice the size of our hands. We looked at each other and silently agreed that we needed to get the hell out of there. I'm not saying it was a skinwalker, but neither of us have ever been able to explain it, and I have never been back. There's this forest near my house in the southeast of England that my friends and I use for mountain biking, but it's got this very uncomfortable, strange vibe to it. The only person we ever see here is the same older man walking his dog, but he always appears when we're feeling really uneasy due to the energy. He'll suddenly just walk past and you never see him coming. There's a tree that has become a memorial for a dog that died, coincidentally a German Shepherd, the same breed as the man has and looks very similar too. Sometimes in the farthest corners of the woods, I distinctly hear a dog collar behind me or nearby. Here's where things get a bit strange. There's a spot we use for campfires and drinking. We were there late at night, around 9 to 10 p.m but gradually began feeling creeped out as the energy started to increase. We started hearing a very strange noise. It was definitely not a fox or a bird. It sounded very sweet and innocent at first until it turned into a blood curdling shrieking. We quickly packed our stuff and went on a mission to get the hell out of Dodge. There's a field that serves as the main access point to the woods. We were using the main path through it and got an overwhelming sense of dread, sadness, and almost anger all mixed together. In the bushes to the side of the path, we heard running, very heavy running. And all of a sudden we started hearing the most horrible growling and screaming noises, getting worse and worse until we got to the exit of the field and it all stopped. We didn't hear it run away but all the noises and running just stopped. We all had strange dreams that night. One time I heard very heavy running footsteps in the bushes right behind me while my friend was having a pee. I turned around to see if it was him, but there's no way it was because he hadn't moved from his spot. He came back and asked if I had heard the running too. Two days ago, I went back there for the first time in around five months alone, as I moved away from the local area. The strange feeling was still there, and in some areas felt like it had gotten worse, but I didn't let it bother me. I went back again today, and there was heavy rainfall the last couple of days, so the ground is very muddy. I kept hearing the dog collar that follows me around, and I noticed strange hoof marks in the ground but they were very inconsistent. Groups of them would appear and then there wouldn't be any more until 15 to 20 meters up the path. They definitely weren't there two days ago and these woods take so long to get into, many people wouldn't bother going there and it's impossible to get a horse in there. I have a few theories about this forest. One, I think it could be a similar presence to Goatman as he was often linked to canine deaths. The potential cryptid activity and hoof marks are consistent with this theory. Two, very unlikely but plausible, it could be the devil's hoof marks. The presence feels very demonic. Third, the forest is potentially a dumping ground for bodies. There was a suspected murder in the local town and police searched the woods. It would explain the strange presence but not the cryptid activity. Or four, People with dirt bikes sometimes use the forest. 
Maybe one of them could have died there and haunts us. People have told me that it's just a deer, but that is impossible. We don't get them around these parts at all. I've literally never seen one. I just have no idea what it is that we witnessed. Here are several odd encounters that I've had. Please tell me what you think they are, or were, and your thoughts on them. All of these occurrences have happened near the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Not near Navajo land, of course, but I was hoping that I could be pointed toward the right information as to whether or not I encountered a skinwalker, or if there's some kind of Eastern cryptid that is similar. Number one. As a child, I used to be really interested in the supernatural. I constantly read about werewolves and vampires, but not about other cryptids, such as skinwalkers and wendigos, until recently. I grew up on a farm surrounded by woods, and the first encounter I had with something unsettling would have been during a sleepover I had with two friends. After a riveting day running through the woods and having fun, we settled down for bed. It was a full moon, and the light pierced through the blinds that I had. My two friends were sleeping on the bottom bunk, while I slept on the top. They had fallen asleep, but I seemed not to be able to sleep, so I decided to peek through the blinds. The full moon stared at me, and I looked away for a second, but when I looked back, there was a creature. The head was shaped similar to that of a horse, with glowing red eyes and shaggy, thick, dark brown hair. It was about two feet lower down than I was, right outside my window, eye level with me. The window was about six feet off the ground. The bunk bed was also about six foot. So this creature must have been about nine feet tall. I don't know what it was, but it certainly scared me, badly. Number two. My best friend C and my other best friend at the time K and I were all having a sleepover together outside in a tent. In our tent, we had one light, a small battery operated lantern. It was dark and quiet outside when all of a sudden a stick was hurled at our tent. My friend C felt that we were in danger, but didn't know from what. C had just moved from Arizona near the Navajo reservation and had recently experienced a skinwalker herself. We had no way to defend ourselves, so we decided to attempt to grab something that could be used as a defense from our car near the tent. C decided to be the one to go and grab it. As she went toward the car, she screamed. She immediately sprinted back with fear in her eyes. We asked her what happened and she told us about a large figure with glowing red eyes resembling a wolf. We ended up leaving that tent for good later on. Finally, number three. As an avid trail runner, I am used to the woods in which I run. I tend to run near dusk as the sun is setting, but I refuse to run when it's dark. I feel at home in the forest. I've never feared it, not until now. Only recently did I experience three odd phenomena. I began to feel like I was being watched while I ran. Yes, I know, the forest is always watching, with all of its animals watching what I'm doing, but this feeling is different. It's more of a fear-inducing feeling. Then about four days after this began, I saw these glowing orbs. Only a couple, but they led deeper and deeper into the woods. All of this led toward a place my father and I found when I was young, where a deer's rib cage was stuck in the hollow of a tree, almost as if it was put there purposely. There's also a big mound of rocks near it. Those rocks were not just randomly placed. They were formed, like a large rectangular shape similar to a grave. I haven't seen the orbs since, but it was unsettling. By far the most unsettling thing that has ever happened there would be the amount of times that I've felt something was following me or chasing me in the woods. 
I've even had this gut feeling that something was trying to lure me deeper into the woods. Whenever I feel that something is so off and that there are malicious intentions, I turn around and go back. The feeling of dread has only gotten stronger, and I'm at a loss for what might be causing it. So, the area that my grandparents lived in was somewhat known for Bigfoot sightings, and my grandfather had seen some signs of it too, a set of footprints in the snow that strode uninterrupted over a four-foot fence, calls from the forest, etc. They live at the edge of a state park in Ohio. I've seen plenty at this point, but back then I hadn't had any experience with the paranormal, at least as far as I knew. Bigfoot fascinated me because of all the cryptids it seemed the most plausible, and I'd spend some of my week there watching documentaries and discussing it with him. Now, he wasn't much of a prankster, but it had happened enough that when something actually did happen, I just thought it was him. I had just gotten into bed at the end of their trailer. I was there for maybe 20 minutes, insomnia, when I heard this call outside the window, passing by quickly down the hill. Imagine an orangutan hoot, not a loud one, just that idle huffing that they kind of do to each other. Pitch that down a ways and then have it coming from lungs that should belong to a bear or a moose. As I said, my first thought was to rationalize that maybe it's grandpa messing with me. He almost had me too. This thought lasted until I remembered the way that the trailer sits on the hill. The bottom of these big windows is sitting six feet off the ground. The noise had definitely come from above me in bed, near the tops of the window. So whatever made that noise was two or three feet higher, and the old guy didn't know any stilts. I wish I'd gone to look, but the realization that something that massive had decided to make a noise right next to me just struck me with paralyzing fear. I was playing around an abandoned area within sight of the trailer later that same week, jumping around rotting beams and poking through whatever was left, when I just stopped. There was a massive, eminent presence behind me all of a sudden. No noise alerted me. I hadn't seen anything move. It was just... pressure. Nothing inherently threatening in it. Just the sheer weight of the gaze is what got me running. I have felt the presence of ghosts, at least one demon. What I'm pretty sure was eldritch shenanigans, and let me tell you, nothing has ever had the weight of that. The power. It felt more real and present than I think people can be. Anybody else have something like this happen? Not a sighting, but just a sense of something? An impossible noise or an encounter that was just too close? Let me know. This incident occurred during the summer of 1983, as I was about to begin my senior year in high school. My family lived in rural Pennsylvania, in northern Indiana County. Our farmhouse was built in the mid-1800s. In the early 1900s, an addition was added to the back that more than doubled the size of the original house. The original house was a four-square house, so called for the four square rooms, two on the first floor and two on the second floor, with a staircase in the back. The house as a whole was sturdy, albeit a bit cranky. Every night in summer I fell asleep listening to the pops, cracks, creaking, and groans as the house cooled off in the night air. The house was built on high ground next to the mouth of an ancient ravine that ran for over a mile deeper and darker and rockier as it went, down to the north branch of a little creek. The ravine was heavily wooded at the beginning. Then the trees got sparser to a few old ones tenaciously rooted into the eroded rocks and glacial till. 
It was dark and cool and damp down in there, even on the hottest summer day, and I spent many summer days down in those woods. I knew the plants, the trees, the birds, the deer. I heard much that I couldn't see, like the rabbits running through the brush and the squirrels high up scolding me as I walked. I could sense the ones that hid and made no noise, the bobcats lurking in the nocturnal critters and peeking at my back after I passed their burrows. Sometimes sudden waves of total silence would descend on the woods. The air would be still, the birds would silence themselves. I taught myself to stop at these moments and to observe. I knew it wasn't me that made the animals go silent, so I figured something, a bobcat perhaps, was close by. I never saw what it was that caused the silences, but I loved to imagine myself as a skilled tracker. Nothing of the sort, of course, but I will claim to know those woods. I also had a friend and companion that roamed the woods and ravines around with me, a big male German shepherd named Chap. Chap loved to run and roam and chase groundhogs. We prowled along through the woods for years. This particular night, I awoke suddenly, very awake and alert. The wind was blowing against the open window. Our room had the crank out windows that were popular in the 70s when the hose had been remodeled. The bottom of the window tilted out and the rain ran off. There was a low rumble off in the distance, the thunder of a summer storm blowing in from the west. I was laying on my belly, my face on the left side on my pillow, and my arms around and under my pillow. I listened to the rain. It was not unusual for me to wake up in the middle of the night. It's been a regular occurrence in my life since I was very young. By that point, I was 17 years old. I was used to my 3 a.m. ritual, though still very irritated by it. Across the room, I could hear my brother breathing. I could hear our dog lying on the foot of my brother's bed, sniffing at the rainy night air blowing in the window. Across the hall from our room, I could hear my dad's low, steady, rumbling snore. Then I heard something that made my eyes fly open in the pitch black room. From down in the ravine, off in the distance, I heard an animal call unlike any I had ever heard. It was a roar, an angry roar. To the best of my knowledge, the apex predator in those woods was the bobcat, but this was too deep, too throaty for a bobcat. Then I heard it again, surprisingly closer, a lot closer. I listened for my brother's breathing. Silence. He was awake. What was that? I loudly whispered. I don't know. He whispered back. There was obvious concern in his voice. Then we heard it again. It had to be no more than 75 feet from the house. Down at the corner of the yard where the trail led into the woods and down into the ravine. First of all, it was no bobcat, it was not a dog, it was not a coyote, and it was most definitely not a man. Next to my bed was a softball bat. I still have it, as a matter of fact. That night, all I wanted in the world was to slide my hand out from under the pillow and reach down and grab that bat. But I couldn't move. Everyone in the house seemed paralyzed. I kept expecting to hear my dad throw his bedroom door open, but he never made a sound. Then, two things happened in rapid succession. There was a tremendous crash, like something or someone had run headlong into the house. Then there was another roaring, screaming howl, this time right next to the house. It was an angry, roaring shout, so loud that I felt like it was next to my face. I had never in all my life heard an animal make a noise that loud. It was like a V8 engine with straight pipes was running wide open throttle. At the same time, there was a throbbing, a low frequency growl that seemed to make the house vibrate. All I could do was close my eyes and try to scream, but nothing came out. I must have passed out. The next thing I know, it was morning. The sun was shining. The house was still there. 
I slept in, which was very unusual in my family. I went downstairs, and my dad and brother had already left for the day. My mom stood at the sink, washing dishes. I looked at my mom wide-eyed. Surely she had heard what happened. She met my eyes and pointed to the back porch of our house, a small side room that housed the washing machine, dryer, and coat closet. I walked to the back porch to see that the door that led to the outside had been ripped from its hinges and lay flat on the floor of the porch. In the coat closet, with his nose pressed as far back as it could go, laying in a puddle of his own urine, was Chap. He lay there, whimpering for two days before he finally came out again. I was given the task to fix the door. When it was up and repaired, I went to my mom and basically asked, are we just gonna pretend that nothing happened last night? My mom sighed with obvious exasperation and said something along the lines of, well, what would you like to know? You know what that was, your dad knows, I know, we all know. Not much to talk about, other than how scary it was, and frankly, I don't need to talk about that, thank you. And for my family, that was pretty much the end of it. I brought it up once not long ago. My dad just shrugged and said, I know as much now as I did that night. Me? I drive there on occasion, when I'm in the area. I stop on the old country road and listen a while. I listen to the wind and the birds, and then I drive on. Sometime in the early 1980s, my family lived in Arizona, as my father was stationed at an army base near Sierra Vista, which is some 70 or so miles south of Tucson. My father, myself, our neighbor, and his three sons were going to lend a hand in the construction of the neighbor's friend's home in the desert, a little over the halfway point between Sierra Vista and Tucson. I'm not sure what a couple of teenagers and a couple of eight-year-old boys were supposed to do, but we were going to be camping in the desert over the weekend. So it was an adventure to me and quality time with my father. For the sake of anonymity and to make explanations easier, we'll call their father Jerry, the eldest brother James, the second oldest Mike, and the youngest Tommy. At any rate, we got to where the site was and we set up camp. Our dads and Jerry's buddies headed out to get some pizzas from the Benson, the closest town to us, close to a half hour away. It was about an hour before dusk and the four of us still at camp were just sitting around a campfire telling stories. The sun had now set and we were checking out the stars that were starting to come into view. Tommy and I hadn't really noticed anything until James had told us to get in the tent as he got up and pulled a rifle out of Jerry's truck. Quickly looking around, we took notice of several pairs of eyes just beyond the reaches of the campfire's light. There was a pack of coyotes all around the camp. Tommy and I made a mad dash for the tent and hunkered down inside, peering out at these watchful eyes through little mesh windows. That's when I noticed something odd. One of these coyotes wasn't like the rest of them. Its eyes seemed to be farther up off the ground than those of the others. The eyes were a deeper yet brighter shade than that of the other coyotes. The campfire made them all appear as silhouettes against the desert backdrop, but this one was much larger. To make it even stranger, the group of coyotes on one side of the camp were pretty much evenly spaced apart but the ones that I was looking at seemed to be farther away from the odd one. It was almost like they were intentionally keeping their distance from it. I'm not entirely sure what I was seeing, but I seemed to instinctively know that what I was looking at was not a coyote. Tommy and I were both scared, but we were scared for different reasons. I was so terrified, I was practically trying to get as low to the ground as I could, 
while still keeping an eye on this odd coyote. If I could have gone past the bottom lining of the tent and buried myself in the sand, I would have. I heard the crack of the rifle as James sent around toward one of the groups. They scattered, but not the odd one. He stood his ground, didn't move an inch. James sent another round off toward the odd one. It flinched and stepped back a few feet. I don't know if he hit it or not. I just know that it scared the crap out of me and I wanted it to go away. Moments later, the headlights of my dad's van came into view and this odd coyote, along with the others, ran off. I didn't want to accept the explanation of just coyote, but I did, simply because I didn't know what it was and I wanted to convince myself that I didn't see what I did. This was one of the few times that I have encountered something that terrified me. Some 30 years later and a whole lot of research, and I'm pretty sure I know what I saw. I just don't want to come out and say it. I'm not exactly sure what this was but I saw something strange in the woods outside of Homer, Nebraska. There's an old graveyard out here that's infamous for having a witch buried there, and it's kind of a local spot for kids to go and scare themselves. Most of the land out there is flat and used for farming, but this graveyard sits on the edge of a big hill and is surrounded by thick woods all around. Anyway, one night at around midnight, Five of my friends and I decided to go out there in the woods and find the grave, because the one in the actual graveyard is fake, and supposedly the real one is out in the forest. So we begin our adventure trekking through the dark night forest. I was in the back because I'm the biggest and strongest. It doesn't take us long to find the real grave, as a couple of the people I was with have been there before. We stick around for a couple of minutes, just messing around and trying to scare each other, when we all just get this instinctual feeling of dread. I know a lot of stories talk about this, but it's a very real feeling. Like your body is responding to danger before you can even realize what's going on. It's probably worth mentioning that as a kid, I lived in a haunted house, and I've been in situations where I've been attacked with a knife and jumped and I've never felt this feeling before. We just decided to get away from that grave. Now this is where us being stupid teenagers almost got us killed. One of the kids I was with says that some people grow substances out here and that he knows where to find some. So even though we all clearly felt something was wrong, we decided, screw it, let's get high. As we started walking back through the woods again, I began to feel like we were being watched, and every now and then I would hear rustling of leaves or just the crackling of undergrowth from behind me. I told my friends we needed to move faster, but they were all saying that I was trying to mess with them. Eventually, as we keep walking, we stumble upon a clearing and we can't really see anything ahead of us. All of a sudden, my friend starts taking off for the other end of the clearing, and we all go after him. All around us, we can hear cattle freaking out. That might sound anticlimactic, but you try getting chased by a 1,200 pound bull. So after we get a couple hundred yards away from the cows, something else scares them way worse than us. I mean, I have never heard a sound like that coming from an animal. It was a horrible mix of the cows being scared to death by something and like an unearthly ear-shattering scream. We got the heck out of there in the opposite direction. Now by this time, I realized we were lost in the middle of the woods at 2 a.m. with something stalking us. I finally convinced everyone that we should change our direction so we could get to the road. And about 30 minutes later, we're making progress as someone spots some headlights way out in front of us that we can see on top of the hill we're on. So we start walking down toward the road when I noticed that the sounds behind us had started back up again. 
I turn to my friend, and I tell him to point his iPhone flashlight back behind us. I only saw something for a second, but about 30 yards behind us, I saw a blackish-brown figure with yellow eyes lean its head out from behind a tree and then quickly duck back behind. This is what really freaked me out, as animals around here don't sneak around and duck behind trees. I got the best look at it out of my friends, and the head looked kind of like a gaunt German shepherd. There aren't any wolves or bears around here. As far as I know, there are no large predators at all. It was a little bit elevated, but it was still eye level with me. I'm 6'3", and this thing was at least six feet. At this point, I take off. I swear I've never run that fast in my life. We make it to the road in under five minutes, but we realized that we came out on the other side of the woods and we had to walk back the three miles down the road toward our cars. It was honestly the scariest night of my life. And to make things worse, I ended up losing my wallet out there that night. I've been back multiple times, but never at night now. Whatever it was, it was not a human or an animal. Based on other stories I've heard, I think it might have been a skinwalker or a dogman. But your guess is as good as mine. I really hesitate to call this a skinwalker encounter, but I call it that because I really can't think of another creature that fits the description. So here we go. A while ago, when I was in early high school, I was left alone at home for some reason. I can't remember the reason, but I was left home alone quite a lot after reaching my teenage years. So a little info on my house is that although I don't live in a rural area, I certainly wouldn't call the area civilized. There are barns within walking distance of my house. I guess the area is developing because there are also subdivisions around. Also, my house has a sliding glass door that leads to a deck in the back. So I was home alone when I heard a knock at the door. It's common for my parents to sometimes leave the house without their house keys. So sometimes I would have to let them in when they got back. My family has a special knock that we use, so whoever's inside knows that it's one of us. This knock didn't sound like one of my family, so I just ignored it because I didn't want to deal with some stranger at the door. Whoever it was knocked again in a more familiar pattern. So reluctantly, I went to the door. When I got there, I didn't notice anyone out front. I figured that whoever it was just left because I took my sweet time getting to the door. Then I guess I heard a sound or something coming from the back sliding glass door. Another thing members of my family do is that if nobody answers the door, they'll try to find another way in, such as the back door. So I went to the back door and didn't notice anyone out there either. I slightly opened the sliding door and I heard a voice. It sounded like my mother but it was coming from underneath the deck. The only reason I say that is because I definitely heard that voice, but my mother wasn't in view of me. Under the deck is the only place she could have been. I can't remember exactly what the voice said, but it was something like, open the door, and it said my name. Now I'm a super paranoid guy, and I know that my mom wouldn't be hiding if she wanted to come inside. So I shut the door, pulled the blinds over and went to my room. Hours later and my mom actually shows up and I tell her what happened. She confirmed that she was not at the house earlier and did not try to get me to open the door. So for years, I didn't really know what to make of this experience. It was a very minor thing, but it spooked the heck out of me. I say it was probably a skinwalker because I don't know any other paranormal entities that would mimic a person's voice to try to lure you outside your house. But what do you think?
So I'll never forget this for as long as I live. It was around December 2004, maybe early 2005, near Burlington, Connecticut. My friend and I were driving around ghost hunting, aka checking out cemeteries and the Green Lady Cemetery at night because we were edgy goth kids. Plus, it was a full moon, so why not? Anyway, we got turned around on some of those back roads and ended up in this weird wooded area. It was winter. There was a little bit of snow on the ground, but not much, maybe a couple of inches or so. We're driving down this really crappy paved road with lots of potholes in our old Honda, going relatively slow. All of a sudden, a deer crosses the road in front of us. My friend, who was driving, brakes. We were only going about 25 to 30 miles per hour. The deer, no joke, stared past our headlights and right at us. And this deer was huge. I don't know how the heck you measure a deer, but I know horses, and I would say that he was about 15 hands at his withers. His antlers were pretty average, nothing too dramatic, but he almost glowed in our headlights. It might have been the moon at that point, but it was still seriously creepy. He stared at us for a solid minute before my friend turned off the headlights. The deer then walked straight at the car, which caused both of us to panic, turn the headlights on and actually drive around the deer, which was still coming at the car. We drive away, now going much faster than 25 to 30 miles an hour, potholes and suspension on the car be damned. I happen to look out the window and no kidding, this deer is pacing us in the woods alongside us. It kept turning its head to look at us. We must have been going at least 40 to 50 miles per hour. We panic, but because of road conditions, we really can't go much faster without crashing or really screwing up the car. Finally, two miles or so down the road, we come up on a brightly lit patch of road with a school and a decent enough intersection that required a stoplight. I see the deer peel off behind our car and run back down the middle of the road. I still don't have any solid theories on what this could have been, but maybe I'm just trying to avoid admitting what I know it was. This is a story that happened to me 18 years ago. When I was seven years old, I lived in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Both of my parents worked in the mornings and the school year had just ended, so I was home alone. From the kitchen window, I saw something strange in the trees, a creature of sorts. Two things I know for sure. Number one, this wasn't a little kid's hallucination. And number two, I know exactly what it looked like. This creature was about the size of a smart car and sitting about 15 feet up in the tree. It had proportions similar to a gargoyle, both in shape and posture. You know, how gargoyles sit hunched over with their back legs wider and their front arms or legs close together or touching just without the wings. No skin was shown. The creature had short bear-like fur mixed with owl-like feathers. The head was massive, the shape of a bear head and possibly a large beak. The only features I'm not totally clear on are some of the features of the face because I was so fixated on the eyes of this beast. They were huge, like the size of basketballs and the odd thing was that they were blurry looking, like a dripping oil painting. It was early summer morning, early enough to still be cool out, but late enough to be clearly lit everywhere. I saw the creature out the kitchen window, ran onto the porch, got a better look at it, and I wasn't about to go and check it out just yet. 
I was still about 50 yards out. I went in to grab my father's binoculars. When I got back to the front porch, the creature was gone, nowhere to be seen. So me, being a brave seven-year-old boy, went out to inspect the area that I'd seen it in. Upon arrival, I saw nothing. No broken branches or markings or anything. The one thing I do remember about the area that was different was that it was dead silent in a forest that's normally bursting with noise. There was not a single thing to be heard. The forest where I used to live was super loud too, with all sorts of animals making sounds at all times of the day and night. But it was dead silent. Super weird. I've never heard of any sort of cryptid that matches what I saw that day, and for 18 years I've been insanely curious. I'm not sure if anybody has anything that could lead me in the right direction, but if you do, I'd be grateful. This is an experience I had that I can't really explain. This occurred in the summer of 2010. My stepdad has an old hunting cabin out in Pennsylvania. It's like a 10 minute drive outside of Cook's Forest. It's a small place with a common area and kitchen and a single bedroom with two bunk beds and a queen size bed. My mom, stepdad and I stayed at the cabin for a weekend to get rid of all the trash that other family members had left there and to do any repairs. There are other cabins nearby, but this weekend there was nobody else at the cabins within a half mile. There were also no street lights or even cell service. This is quite literally off the beaten path in the middle of the forest. We came up Friday, worked all day Saturday and left on Sunday. Saturday evening after dinner and a bonfire, everything is pitch black outside. No bugs chirping, dead quiet, which is relatively normal. At least most of the time, it's pretty quiet at night. We decide to head in. My stepdad and I are inside reading while my mom steps out to have a smoke and check to make sure that the fire has burned down to a safe level. I'm mid-page down in my book, and I hear my mom yelp pretty loudly. Now, I'm used to hearing her make this yelp. She's done it when she has seen a snake or gets a bug in her hair, so I didn't really think much of it. She comes in limping, though, and she says, Someone threw a rock at me. Immediately, my stepdad grabs his gun and runs outside, hoping to catch whoever did it. I was in shock not sure of what to think. I'm sitting with my mom while my stepdad makes laps around the cabin. He fired a few warning shots at the backstop we have set up on the back of the property to scare off whoever was around. We never saw anybody run off or even make a noise. When we go up, we always make jokes about Bigfoot now. And to be clear, there were no cabins on the road near us that had people staying at them. So I have no idea who would have been lurking in the woods in a pitch black forest just to mess around with people. They would have had nowhere to go, nowhere to stay, no transportation. It just makes no sense. Did we run into Bigfoot? Maybe. But as of now, I don't know. When I was younger, around 18, I was visiting my aunt in Albuquerque. She lived at a little B&B &B that had a big field behind it at the time. The second night I was there, I couldn't sleep. Around midnight, this bizarre howl or scream or cry started up. It was really loud, even inside the house. 
Her cats seemed to be alerted as well. So I woke my aunt up. She said that she had never heard that in 10 years of living there. Bear in mind, she's an insomniac, so she's often up very late. When the sound kept going, she started toward the door to go see what it was. But I was like, I don't think so. So we stayed in. The sound continued until around sunrise. The owner of the B&B was out of town at the time, but when asked, she said that she had never heard a sound like that either. We asked some of her friends who said that they had heard that somebody was going around playing sounds on a loop, trying to lure people out of the house. That's really the only lead I have. I went out into the field the next day and I didn't see anything weird. Maybe it was just someone messing with people, trying to lure them out for some nefarious reason. Or maybe it was a cryptid. Either way, it was pretty creepy. My hometown is small and remote, and we had a Native American reservation a few minutes outside of town. I was close to a lot of the people that lived there, mostly the teenagers and children, as they shared extracurricular activities through the school, so I grew pretty accustomed to their beliefs. Now, I moved pretty far away right before I started high school, but I visited somewhat frequently, as I still had family there. My grandmother owned a camp on a small lake. It was very quaint and nice to spend time there. However, as soon as it became dark out, things felt very different. On one side, we had neighbors for miles. On the other, it was dense woods. My cousins and I, one a year older and one a year younger, had always found those woods creepy. We visited now and then, but always became very uncomfortable and soon left. One night, I was traveling back home, down south with my cousins and my aunt. These were very remote lake roads, inhabited by very, very few. Dense woods bordered both sides, so, naturally, some nocturnal animals were out. But one that we saw was very different. It wasn't as big as I typically see these creatures described, but it wasn't small either. Maybe the size of a large coyote or a small wolf. And we don't live in wolf country, by the way. But it didn't look like either of those. It was crouched back on its hind legs, just kind of chilling out. As we drove past, it turned its head to look at us. It had a pretty blank face, almost like an owl's, but without the beak, and a bear's muzzle instead. Its body looked like a poor rendition of a human. Like if you asked someone to draw a person, but they had never seen one before. Its legs bent the wrong way, like a horse almost. It had toes like an alpaca. Its arms were very long. And frankly, it was the most human thing about it. It had very patchy, wiry, matted fur. Now, I know it wasn't an animal with mange. I've seen many animals with mange. And yes, it's scary, but it was nothing like this thing. It didn't necessarily chase us, but it trotted behind us for a while. Everybody was freaking out, naturally. But I think deep down, I knew. Can I get any confirmation or information about what this might have been? And if so, are there any precautions I should take to keep this thing away? It happened years ago, but I'm still lost. It was winter of 2017, around December. I was camping with friends right outside of a Native American reservation near St. George, Utah. None of us are native, but we were trying very hard to be respectful of the land. 
We set up an A-frame, and every night we packed in like sardines. I was on the outside, and my buddy Seth was next to me. Coyotes are pretty common in this area of the country, but they're pack animals who don't really engage with campers, so it's very common to hear them, but not as common to see them up close. However, every night that week, we saw this mangled old coyote, gray hair, blistering skin, probably on the edge of death. It walked with a limp in its front left paw, kind of like a dog that gets a pebble stuck in their paw. Anyway, we went to bed one night and I was still on edge. Around 3.15, I woke up with a sharp pain in my ear. It ended up being a beetle burrowing in my ear, but that's not important. Anyway, I hit the side of my head and I pressed my ear and I was freaking out because it was this really acute pain that I had never felt before. I thought I was having an aneurysm or something. Anyway, I woke Seth up to have him shine a light in my ear. As soon as he woke up, he freaked out. Like he was horrified. I was like, what is it? He reached above his head and gets a mirror and he holds it up to me so that I could see behind myself. To my horror, there's a scraggly old man with gray hair, a huge tumor on the side of his face, torn up clothes, walking with a cane and a limp. He doesn't seem to be at all cognizant of us. It was almost as though he was in a different dimension. He didn't have a gun or anything, so we just clutched our knives and kept our eyes on him for the rest of the night. At one point, he just wandered away. The next morning, the two other people with us said that they both had a dream that this kid, Chris, who wasn't with us, was tied to a tree upside down and a massive silver glowing elk slowly but surely gutted him alive with its horns. They said the four of us and a few other friends all sat nude around the tree, not drumming or chanting, but almost like we were sacrificing him. They both had exactly the same dream and were able to independently draw the same picture down to the order that we were all sitting in to the number of branches on the tree without consulting each other. We texted Chris when we left and he said he'd been up all night throwing up completely inexplicably. I don't know if we saw a skinwalker or what, but that was the weirdest experience of my life. I think I had an experience with a skinwalker or its kin. I wonder how far their territory ranges. I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years at the turn of the century. I had two friends who grew up in Globe, a guy and a girl. She wanted to do a spell to make it rain. We went to a place on the Salt River. I don't know what it was called, but it had a parking lot, a pavilion, a bathroom, and the river had concrete steps in it, like man-made rapids. The pavilion had a concrete dais in the middle of it, inlaid with a mosaic of a compass rose. We got there at about 9 p.m. or so, well after dark, only two cars in the parking lot, and they were dusty, no other people. While we were doing our spell, which was minimal, all three of us standing quietly, concentrating around a candle and incense, I heard a noise. It was men and women laughing in unison, then two voices speaking very quickly, but I couldn't understand the words. And then a canine howl. My hair stood on end. We all jerked our heads toward the parking lot and stood stock still for a minute, but we didn't see anything or hear anything else. So we went back to concentrating. I didn't think the voices were weird in the moment. I figured the people that owned the cars had come back I did think the howl was odd coupled with the voices, but I was thinking, cool, I got to hear a coyote. So after we finished the spell, we started wondering where the people were. 
And as we started talking, we realized that of the three of us, the girl had heard the speaking voices, the guy had heard the laughing, but I was the only one who had heard both or the howl. When I told them what I'd heard, they both got really pale. Their whole demeanor changed to alarm and they said, we have to get out of here right now. I said, okay, but I have to pee first. They were very upset by this, but the bathroom was right by us. I went, but they were banging on the door in total panic after I'd been in there 30 seconds. I thought they were being overly dramatic. So we made it to the car and they're acting like we're in a horror movie. We left without further incident. After we got on the road, I asked them why they were so upset. They said that there were things that lived out there that I didn't want to know about. Apparently people who live in Globe have to deal with this kind of thing a lot, based on more stories the guy told me about living there. He never mentioned the word skinwalker though. I read about them later and finally understood why they were so scared that night. My grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious for lack of a better word. She's not necessarily religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana and she grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful typical boring old people stuff, except she always kept her curtains drawn shut and would always peek out the window. And whenever somebody would ask her what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yenoglushi is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother, he's 19 now, we're in the front yard that evening planting flowers when all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting, get away from that creature, it's not safe, to my brother. Of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake, so we all run outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house. Standing out in the yard, was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog. It was staring at my grandmother with an intensity that I have never seen before. It looked up at us, gave a little huff, and bounded off. I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but I do remember that it had very deep yellow eyes. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened, she kept repeating, the Yenald Lucia has found me. She moved a couple of weeks after that. I guess this story is a little boring, but it just happened to me, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we use to communicate that we are safe at the top of a route are, name the guy on the ground, off belay, which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is, name of the guy at the top of the route, belay off. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on an about 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone is having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor, which is what we thought was going on. But then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground, like close enough that we could have had a shouting conversation and way farther left off route of where the climber should have been, 
said, my name, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He said to me, what the F was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time and that we shouldn't be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving, but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Turns out it wasn't. A few moments later, the rope starts moving again, later followed by a faint syllable counted, my name off belay, that sounded way more like it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that got burned in on a route when someone took him off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he hears the voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to figure out what's going on, then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. I'm starting to wonder if there's a cryptid that can mimic the voice of a certain person. We're not entirely sure what happened, but we know two things. Number one, it's a really good idea that I didn't listen to that first voice. And second, it wasn't a person. This happened a few months ago, and I've kept it to myself until recently when I told my dad about it. I was with my brother, who we'll call John, and one of our old friends. We were walking back through a forest back to where we'd come from. Since I'm younger than both of them, they tend to annoy me a lot, but this time they were being really annoying, so I decided to walk ahead. I was about halfway between them and the exit to the forest when I heard things snapping on my left. I just brushed it off and kept walking, but then I started to hear a low mumbling noise, so I stopped and looked around. I asked if anyone was there, and I got no reply until about 30 to 40 seconds later. I heard what sounded like my brother saying, come here, I need your help. So I asked what was wrong while keeping my distance because something about his voice sounded wrong. It was distorted. So I waited a few seconds and then he said again, come here, I need your help, but in the exact same way as before. So I moved to the side and that's when I see it. It was a deer, but it was on its back legs and its body was rigid and twisted. The worst part was that its eyes were exactly the same as mine, like a human's. I didn't believe that it was a bad creature. It actually seemed quite friendly, but nonetheless, I was scared. So I ran a mile back and the whole time I could feel it behind me. When I got out of the forest, I fell to my knees and looked back to see it disappear behind some trees. But here's the weird thing. Ever since then, I've been having bad dreams. Not about being chased by it or anything. In the dreams, I am it. So I told my dad about this and he didn't look surprised or confused at all. He told me of a similar event he had when he was young. To this day, I remember how it felt. That was the first time that I saw it, but I doubt it will be the last. I just got home from a road trip and I've been thinking about something I saw and can't make sense of. Maybe some of you have also seen something like this. My wife and I were driving on Highway 97 South near Mount Shasta, California. 
It was about midnight, and we were driving through a heavily wooded area without any street lamps. We rounded a corner when I saw something fast and low to the ground dart across the street about 50 to 60 yards ahead of us. I saw the glowing animal eyes and a body that was the size and shape of a big dog. We saw animals the whole road trip, and like usual, I asked my wife if she had seen it too, and she confirmed. The body wasn't 100% clear because of our headlights, they hadn't reached that section of the road yet. When we got to the exact point in the road where the animal had crossed, we looked to that side to see if there was anything there. All there was, was a man dressed in army fatigues walking down the road. He didn't look at us, he just kept walking. It was pitch black and he didn't have any type of light with him. He was only illuminated by our headlights. We both got full body chills when we saw him because we were expecting to see an animal. I know that area has a magical and mystical history with a lot of unexplained sightings, but this is unlike anything I've ever experienced before. We were fully creeped out. I still can't make heads or tails of this, so I figured I'd tell you the story. Does anyone else have a story like this that happened to them?